ESPN TV takes us live. After a brief pause, I will call us to order. Good afternoon again. Tansi, Okimao Pi Sim, Nitisi Mikason. This is Director DeWolf. I am now calling the November 18th, 2020 regular board meeting to order at 3.30 p.m. It's also important we do acknowledgement of uh, and protocol here. So we live and go to a school in a city that is the ancestral homeland to the Duwamish people, the Muckleshoot Nation and the Suquamish Nation. We acknowledge them as custodians of this land since time immemorial as guests, and in many of our cases, as settlers on this land, we extend our deepest gratitude and respect to their ancestors and elders, past, present, and future. Ms. Wilson-Jones, roll call, please. Director Hampson. Here. Director Harris. Present. Director Percy. Here. Director Mack. Here. Director Rankin. Director Rankin. Doesn't sound like she's joined quite yet. Director Rivera Smith. Present. And Director DeWolf. Present. Thank you, Ms. Wilson Jones. Superintendent Juneau is also joining us for today's meeting and additional staff will be briefing our board as we move through today's agenda. As we begin this meeting, I would also like to wel welcome Bella Kniep, who is joining us as a student representative from Garfield High School today. And we will also be hearing from Bella's peer, excuse me, from Bella's peer later in the meeting as well, um, who is Garfield sophomore Monet Davis, who will be leading off our testimony list. Um, this meeting today is being held remotely per the governor's proclamation prohibiting meetings such as this one from being held in person. The public is being provided remote access today by phone and through SPS TV by broadcast and streaming on YouTube. To facilitate today's meeting, I will ask all participants to ensure you're muted when you are not speaking. Staff may be uh, muting participants to address feedback and ensure we can hear directors and staff. And with that, I will now turn it over to Superintendent Juneau for her comments. Okay, thank you, President DeWolf and directors, and welcome, Bella. Um, first, I just want to thank everybody um, for everything that you've been doing, and uh, especially the board. I know governing and even virtually meeting is not easy. Um, we've all been in this remote setting for really a long time now, and I know that we are all feeling a little weary and no one is immune to this level of disruption and uncertainty, and none of us um, were really prepared to educate or work during a pandemic. In addition to remote learning, we all have our regular lives going on as well. And I know that many of our staff and you and our families um, are all, you know, some have children at home while remote working, and some of you are taking care of elders in your family. And some of you may feel isolated as the stay home orders become more strict. And I think that really is just what's so hard about all of this. What would be usual life struggles are so amplified right now. And, you know, as the virus and continues to spike and uh, do its damage, so many of us now know family, friends, and colleagues who have contracted the virus, who have been sick, who've been hospital hospitalized or who have died. Um, I just continue to hear from a lot of different audiences. What's so hard about all of this? What would be usual? <laughs> How difficult the situation is for our students, families, and staff. I do want to thank our educators, families, and students for completing the Pulse survey. The Remote Learning Task Force will review this data and make recommendations on how we can make this remote learning better for everyone. Central office leaders are using this data to make adjustments to our operational systems. I have visited with our school leaders and educators, and they express a need for some relief from the wariness and the big workload that results from being in a remote setting. So starting Monday, November 
23rd through the December break as we're heading into holidays, schools will be reducing their office hours to 10 hours per week. Um, so people should please check with your school for the hours of operation. And also central office staff, um, we're looking for ways to reduce the workload for elementary teachers on Wednesdays, at least through the end of the semester. Uh, more information about this will be coming soon as we work through all the ins and outs. Um, last, I have dedicated $100,000 from the superintendent's budget to support the social emotional needs of the adults at Seattle Public Schools. I know that our social emotional health must be strong in order to support the needs of our students, and I am more committed than ever to ensuring the health and wellness of staff and students in SPS. And as you heard last night at the work session, um, it's important for everyone to know that the Ethnic Studies Program Manager position has posted. I want to thank Dr. Scarlett and Dr. El Ansi uh, for their work with community, including NAACP, the NAACP Youth Council, the Ethnic Studies Advisory Group, and others um, to ensure that we are meeting the community needs with this position. I just look forward to watching this work flourish under their leadership. President Wolf, this concludes my remarks and thanks and welcome again to everybody. Thank you, Superintendent Janome. Okay, I, again, I would like to uh, welcome Bella Knipp. Uh, Bella is a sophomore at Garfield High School and is involved in student government as the class of 2023 treasurer and is also involved in wrestling and track and field. Bella, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm super um, happy to be here today. Um, okay. Good afternoon to Superintendent Juno, school board members, and everyone watching today on Microsoft Teams. My name is Bella Knipe, and I am a sophomore at Garford High School, home of the Bulldogs. We as scholars and educators see our school as an active, diverse, and dedicated community. Garfield's academics is a major focus at Garfield, Last year, 100% of our seniors graduated on time. Garfield High School's population of 1,857 students has grown by 14% over the past five years. Last year, our boys and girls basketball varsity team won state. Our band and orchestra is a large part of Garfield, especially during our pep assemblies and sports games. There is always lots of hype and spirit. We have over 800 athletes that participate in Garfield sports. At Garfield, there are over 50 clubs during lunch and after school that you can join. You can even start your own. We had a very successful virtual club fair today. It was awesome. Garfield isn't just a school for arts and sports and band and orchestra, but it was also a place of culture, individuals, athletes, activists, writers, musicians, actors and actresses, and artists. When Principal Howard announced school was out on March 13th, we didn't know we'd be facing a global pandemic. COVID-19 has impacted everyone emotionally and physically. Both students and teachers have found new ways to learn and educate in ways we never thought was possible. Garfield would appreciate the school board's increase in support so we can continue to thrive during these uncertain times. I thank you for your time and go Bulldogs. Thank you so much, Bella, and yes, go Bulldogs. We didn't know we'd be facing a global pandemic. COVID-19 has impacted everyone. Okay. We have now reached the consent portion of today's agenda. May I have a motion for the consent, consent agenda, please? I move approval of the consent agenda. I second the motion. Uh, okay. Approval of the consent agenda has been moved by Director Hampson and seconded by Director Harris. Do directors have any items they would like to remove the, from the consent agenda? Yes. Director yes. Harris. Director Mack. Yes. Director Harris first. Fair enough. I would like to remove item number five, memorandum of understanding with Principals Association of Seattle School. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Director Mack. Yeah, I'd like to remove number four, approval of the four successor collective bargaining agreements between Seattle Public Schools and the International Union of Operating Engineers 609. Thank you. May I have a revised motion for the consent agenda as amended, please? I move approval of the consent agenda as amended. Thank you. I second as amended. 
approval of the consent agenda as amended has been moved by Director Hampson and seconded by Director Harris. All those in favor of the consent agenda as am amended, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, this motion has passed unanimously. I do want to, uh, for the record, make sure that Director Rankin is included and she joined us at about 3.33. Um, so please uh, adjust the record to reflect that. Thank you, hello. We have now, yes, we have now reached, um, we have now reached uh, the public testimony portion um, but as, as it is not yet 345, I would like to ask directors if they would like to give uh, board committee reports now in lieu of taking a four minute recess. Um, and so we can begin the testimony at 345 PM. Um, are directors uh, ready to share board committee reports? If we could keep these to about just two minutes high level, um, are any directors willing to volunteer for to go first? Director Mack, this was your, your your request to the to the board for our agenda. So I'm curious if you'd like to give a board committee report from operations committee in the next four minutes before our public testimony begins. Yeah, I wasn't prepped and ready to do that, but I'm happy to to do it on the fly. I've been adding that to my board comments at the end of the meeting, um, and I didn't realize it was on the agenda. So appreciate that it is now. Um, uh, so yeah, operations committee uh, next meetings on December third and. Um, obviously a good number of items today uh, on our agenda from the last meeting. Um, upcoming, we have um, uh, a couple of special attention items that uh, folks may find interesting as a traffic safety committee site planning guidance. That traffic safety committee is actually a, a city of Seattle um, committee about uh, traffic safety that we support and sit on. Uh, and um, additionally, we'll have a presentation around the Mercer boundaries um, uh, process, uh, kind of where we're at with community engagement and um, uh, proposals, et cetera. And um, the West Seattle Land Exchange, which I think there's been two by twos with folks on, uh, but maybe of interest, uh, as well as capacity mitigation uh, for the next school year. Um, and a good number of final acceptances, which are always my favorite uh, when we uh, be, are able to close out uh, great projects. And um, yeah, high level, that's, that's what I got for you. Um, thanks for, uh, uh, putting this back onto the agenda so that we can hear from each other about what's going on in committees. Of course, thank you. And in these few moments before we begin public comment, I can just share our uh, executive committee kind of report out. So um, this this month we focused on um, this, the CBAs and MOU, both with PASS and 609, which were just pulled from consent. We also heard from the ITAC, they pre presented their annual report. Um, in addition, we started conversations around policy 1005, which is responsibilities and authority of the board, as well as policy 1640, which is responsibilities and authority of the superintendent. Um, that conversation will also take place in December, and we'll also be inviting, we have invited um, our, our labor partner, the Principals Association, uh, PASS, to join us for December, and we'll also hear um, uh, an update on our government relations as we head into the legislative session. So with that, I will uh, get us um, started with some housekeeping before we move into public testimony as we are about a minute to go. So we will next move to public testimony. We will be taking public testimony by pe teleconference today as stated on the agenda. For any speakers watching through SPS TV, please call in now to ensure you're on the phone line when your name is called. Board Procedure 1430BP provides the rules for testimony, and I ask that speakers are respectful of these rules. I will sum summarize some important parts of this procedure. 
First, testimony will be taken today from those individuals called from our public testimony list and, if applicable, the waiting list, which are included on today's agenda posting on the school board website. Only those who are called by name should unmute their phones and only one person should speak at a time. Speakers from the list may cede their time to another person when the listed speaker's name is called. The total amount of time allowed will not exceed two minutes for the combined number of speakers and time will not be restarted after the new speaker begins. In order to maximize opportunities for others to address the board, each speaker is allowed only one speaking slot per meeting. If a speaker cedes time to a later speaker on the testimony list or waiting list, the person to whom time was ceded will not be called to provide testimony again later in the meeting, as there is only one speaking slot per person. Those who do not wish to have time ceded to them may decline and retain their place on the testimony or wait list. Finally, the majority of the speaker's time today should be spent on a topic they have indicated they wish to speak about. I'll now turn it over to Ms. Wilson-Jones for final um, logistical notes. Thank you, Director DeWolf. Um, speakers, please remain muted until your name is called to provide testimony. When your name is called, please be sure you have unmuted on the device you are calling from and also press star six to unmute yourself on the conference call line. Each speaker will have a two minute speaking time and a chime will sound when your time is exhausted and then the next speaker will be called. First on today's public testimony list is Monet Davis. Monet, you can go ahead. Good afternoon to Superintendent Juno, the school board, everyone who's watching and on the team's meeting. My name is Monet Davis, a sophomore at Garfield High School, home of scholars, champions and legends. I'm here today to talk about Garfield's concerns regarding how our education and community is going so far in this unfortunate school year. We would like to see changes and more resources brought to our school, turning on mics or maybe even turning on cameras in class for a couple of days during the week would be nice. So not only students will be engaged, but teachers will know that students are focused. This can build community and help students feel more comfortable because school should be a safe place. That being said, we believe using Zoom instead of Microsoft Teams would be more effective for everyone. In larger classrooms, students have experience getting logged out in the middle of meetings and most of the time aren't able to hear one another on Teams. Zoom provides more resources and is less complicated when it comes to bad internet connection or large meetings. We want ethnic studies to continue to be a focus for all students in the school district. In terms of finding a new principal for our dear high school, students and staff want to help decide who will be hired as our next principal. Mr. Howard was a great principal and we want someone just as great as him. The only people who understand the issues and solutions needed at Garfield are the Bulldogs. And I want you guys to hear our concerns strong and strongly take our advice. Thank you, for, thank you for what you're doing for Seattle Public Schools during this pandemic. Take care, stay safe, and stay healthy. Go dogs. Thank you so much, Monet. Next is Leilani Norman. Leilani Norman. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. I'm from the Blackfeet Nation and I am a sophomore at Chief South High School. My name is Yellow Buffalo Stone Woman. My English name is Leilani Norman. Today I will be talking about the negativity and the corruption in the Seattle school's academics. A little backstory, when I was in eighth grade, my history class had had to learn about the good perspective of Columbus. And in ninth grade, my reading and writing class was taught that reservations is the most terrible place that anyone can live on. As a person who has family and has lived there, I have felt as if it was a very degrading lesson. Our First Nations should not be looked upon from a white egotistical perspective and to be taught to students who don't know the real life of our First Nations people. They should not be taught that reservations are filled with drunks, drug addicts, trash, and much more horrible ways to put it. Our people and myself are sick of having stereotypes shoved down our throats. We are sick of asking 24 seven to the Seattle schools to be respectful and teach the truth in that it's not hard to connect with our existing cultures. Therefore, I'm requesting more focus and respect in the curriculum and more emphasis and empowerment for our First Nations students. 
Not everything is like Disney, Sherman Alexie's experience, and that book signals isn't the only way to teach, uh, for teachers to teach about reservations and the history of our First Nations people. This is a long overdue in SPS and our parents, our grandparents, and our elders have been trying to change this for a long time. And now our youth should be heard in respect of our First Nations people. As I'm asking for these to be made immediately, thank you for your time. Next on the testimony list is Chris Jackins. Chris Jackins. My name is Chris Jackins, Box 84063, Seattle 98124. On the bargaining agreements with Operating Engineers Local 609, two points. Number one, it appears that the removal of pesticide usage from a job description does not mean that the district is eliminating pesticides, but rather that employees will no longer get a premium for such work. Number two, summary point number 14 states that district may unilaterally transfer employees if it ends a disruption to the educational or work environment. This sounds like employees are losing a right of a review that is central to their jobs. Please vote no. On the Outdoor Education Task Force, please amend the proposal to include specific early target dates such as February 2021 for large-scale implementation of outdoor education on the condition that coronavirus levels allow it. On the contract for Lincoln, Three of the four attachments to the report are only available upon request. Attachments which are not attached should not be called attachments. Please delay action by two weeks. On new rules for appeals, four points. Number one, the district seems to want to discourage appeals because it believes its environmental documents are very accurate. Number two, on the recent West Seattle elementary decision, the district provided an incorrect address for the school. Number three, the district has issued new rules that only allow people with email to ask for further environmental review on district projects. Number four, this is discriminatory and violates district claims of transparency. Please change this. Thank you. Next on the testimony list is Dr. Carol Simmons. Dr. Carol Simmons. Dr. Simmons, please press star six to unmute if you're on the line. The Seattle Public Schools strategic plan has not yet identified and addressed the inequities that exist with regard to native education. The goals, objectives, and theory of action are laudable, but they are not designed for 30% of native students who continue to be enrolled in special education and are disproportionately negatively affected in academic achievement and disciplinary sanctions. The language in the plan's theory of action was meant to improve underserved students' education, but the action has not followed the intent of the theory. Washington's House of Representatives Education Chair Santos writes, quote, I urge you, Board of Directors, to reconsider your decision to terminate the longstanding partnership between the district and Urban Native Education Alliance. This action contradicts the stated mission of Seattle Public Schools and its adoption of the strategic plan. When the focus of ensuring racial equity in our educational system and unapologetically addresses the needs of students of color who are furthest from educational justice, the action of terminating a successful program that served Native youth is contradictory to the strategic plan's theory of action, which is, to directly work in partnership with families and communities who represent students furthest from educational justice, unquote. Please follow your theory of action and work in partnership with UNEA, families, and communities, rather than closing Native schools, terminating Native programs, and evicting Native students from their historic cultural sites. Thank you. Next for testimony is Sarah Sense Wilson. Sarah Sense Wilson.
Go ahead, Sarah. In honor of Native Heritage Month, UNEA would like to continue our tradition of advocacy for Indian education and Native students. A history lesson in Seattle Public School Legacy of Broken Promises and Trail of Mistrust and Dishonesty. In 2013, SPS board member Sharon Peasley and several Pinehurst parents and staff approached UNEA pleading for help with saving Pinehurst Alternative School from impending closure. UNEA, along with a collective of Native educators, elders, parents, and youth, formalized a partnership proposal to transform Pinehurst into a Native-focused K-8 school. The board approved this proposal, outlined a number of, and outlined a number of Seattle Public School commitments, including number one, MOU with UNEA, and also resources to co-develop a culture-based framework to support both a climate and culturally enriched environment to achieve our vision. The school board approved the proposal but has failed to uphold the Native Community Partnership. As part of SPS's trend to gentrify and redline Seattle schools, SPS has evicted and relocated Licton Springs from Robert Eagle staff and in true boarding school fashion, stripped the school of all American Indian identity. The new Licton Springs principal flagrantly ignores emails and requests for meetings. SPS clanship seems to impervious to the voices of Native community and remains resolved in the willful erasure of BIPOC students. From a historical perspective, SPS has symbolically called in the cavalry and reincarnated Indian annihilators to eradicate students from existence. Reminiscent of notorious General Kit Carson, General Andrew Jackson, and John Chivington. What is your legacy? How will you be remembered? The eye of history are watching. Thank you. Next for testimony is Hunter Sherbeck. Hunter Sherbeck. Hunter, go ahead. Hello. We can hear you. All right. Awesome. All right. Hello, my name is uh, Hunter Sherbick. I'm part of the Standing Rock Tribe, and I am a high school senior. And today I am suggesting some recommendations for Native education during COVID-19. These suggestions are based on research and in consultation with professionals and the Native community. According to the Society for Research and Child Development, Native students experience an increased degree of vulnerability due to negative consequences of COVID, resulting in further distancing our Native students from educational equity. Interestingly enough, while research and common sense point to establishing a strategy for sharing resources for the most vulnerable, we see in Seattle a multitude of barriers, hoops, traps, and dead ends for Native students. The apparent lack of a comprehensive strategy to bridge district, community, and student needs has been exposed by the prolonged and protracted neglect of our district leadership under the watchful eye of all elected officials. According to SRCD, ongoing inequitable conditions may be experienced as interlocking systems of oppression, increasing the chance of poor educational outcomes for Native students. Furthermore, it is noted that evidence supports what Native people have always known. Connections with Native culture and community protect and buffer children from the trauma of inequity. We suggest SPS establish a plan to engage Native community and Native-led CBOs to develop a multifaceted uh, strategy to reach self-identified Native students enrolled in SPS for bridging resources, support, and connection to best mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on our families and students. SPS may start by acknowledging the harm that has been committed against our community by way of ongoing failures to address issues raised and ignored by students and families in the community. Next, establish a healing and reconciliation coalition as steps towards a restorative process for relationships to mend and begin healing. Individuals and community members have provided guidance and initiated this request over three years ago. We are already out of breath with the losses and compounding effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on our families and communities. Please take this suggestion and commit to decolonizing at all levels, starting with each one of you. Thank you. Next on the list for public testimony is Kayla Harst. Kayla Harst. Uh. Name is Kayla Harst. Go ahead, Kayla. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Hi, my name is Kayla Harstad. I am from on Chippewa and Assiniboine, and I'm a junior at Ingham High School. I'm here to talk about Indian education and solutions for improving our student experience at Ingham High School and across the district. At Ingham High School, there is a void of Indigenous influence and a silencing of Native student voices, and most noticeable, a lack of support for students to connect with the Native community. Avoiding the inclusive practices supporting Native participation, visibility, and experience. No space or place for Native students to convene, refuel, share, practice cultural traditions, or share resources and have identity safety. We should have identity safety at all schools, not only Nathan Hill High School or Chief Bell. We spend a week learning about 9-11. In stark contrast, most schools, including Ingham, do not even acknowledge Indigenous Peoples Day or Native Heritage Month. I propose a cross-district recognition of Indigenous Peoples Day in every school and in every classroom with dedicated time for class discussions about Indigenous issues, contributions, and contemporary experiences. Designated building or room space for Indigenous students to feel comfortable and have the resources they need. I've seen a number of my Native peers drop out of Ingram and I've wondered if the resources had been available, would my Native peers have successfully graduated from Ingram? We should be able to feel culturally connected to our school and have a place we can go to with trusted adults. I suggest a land acknowledgement to be adopted by Ingram and to be read right along with the Daily Pledge of Allegiance. Our Ingram land acknowledgement will be co-authored by Indigenous Student Association members, elders, and community. I suggest every school have a co-created land acknowledgement. I also think we need to include Indigenous art around the school. There is no visual art representing Native culture at all around the Ingram campus. We need to incorporate some type of mural or land acknowledgement piece that could be represented in our Indigenous community. These projects could be led by Indigenous Student Association and would inspire multicultural unity among other students as well. We need to showcase Native perspectives in each and every classroom by the way of art, images, pictures, literature, speakers, and staff. We need the beautiful parts of being Indigenous to be included in our everyday space. I invite Seattle Public Schools to re-envision Indian education together. Next on the public testimony list is Kay Fiddler. Kay Fiddler. Hello. Go ahead, Kay. My name is Kay Fiddler. I'm an enrolled member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Ojibwe. It is Native American Heritage Month. I'm just stopping by to let you know that all Native, not all Native American history is in the past. Some of it is happening currently. We are still alive. The board, the superintendent, director of current time. Not as responded. Just because you don't like a person or don't like hearing opposing views doesn't mean you can disregard your own rules. Pretending we, members of the Native community, don't exist isn't okay. You need to act like adults, like the adults we elected into leadership by people like me, paid by people like me. I look forward to your response to the email I sent. Next for public testimony is Brooke Stromy. Brooke Stromy. Brooke, are you on the line? Brooke, you may need to press star six to unmute. Calling one more time for Brooke Stromy. Moving to the next speaker on the testimony list, Sabrina Burr. Sabrina Burr, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, I want to address a couple things. First of all, I want to address distant learning. Um, this week, my daughter copied the chat from one class to find out that she had gotten the chat for all of the classes um, for all day from all of those teachers. To me, this is a violation of privacy and something has to be done. In addition to dinging of classes and the bells going off for all of the classes, we should not be able to know what students are saying in every classroom. So I just hope that we address that because that has to be um, in violation of FERPA. I wanna talk about um, 
outdoor uh, learning um, and the task force. And I want to say that this is imperative, especially in this climate where students' mental health are, um, are, are, are so critical right now. I um, am a parent who went on all of the science field trips in, the out, in, in outdoor learning. Fifth grade, when we got to Islandwood, our Southeast students got to Islandwood, said Islandwood looks just like our backyard. For three years at South Shore, um, I went on science walking field trips three times once a week with all three classes. One thing that I learned is students who were not emotionally right once we got outside in the outdoor, um, they came back with a different amount of calm. You put dirt and nitrate there um, and that was even um, stronger. What I find is how students collaborate in the outdoor and outdoor is not just for science, it's for math, it's for language arts and it's for art. Twice we did art installation at the urban farm in Southeast Seattle, um, owned by Seattle Tilt, um, where they opened it up to the whole school. So it's really important for us to find outdoor spaces for our students to learn and to thrive, especially in this climate. So please get the task force going and get the right people there so that we can make it successful. Thank you. That was the final speaker on today's testimony list. Thank you, Ms. Wilson-Jones. And thank you to- Hi, this uh, is Brooke Strami. I'm sorry, my phone didn't um, unmute before. Is it possible to still give testimony? Brooke, yes, we, we, you, just in the nick of time, for sure. We, we, we do have a slot for you, Ms. Wilson-Jones, if we could- Go ahead, break. Brooke. Thank you. Hello, my name is Brooke Strami, Certified Educator and Support Staff UNEA. The COVID-19 pandemic has added new challenges for Native families within the community and further exasperated already existing challenges. Since the pandemic fully took effect in our city, UNEA has been in close contact with Native families already within the UNEA community and beyond, assessing the needs of, of needs out there and looking for solutions. Our community outreach program has served 61 Native families throughout the pandemic, with nearly half of these being SBS families. We have provided these families with groceries on a monthly basis, but also critical technology such as laptops and printers. We have been able to reach families with furniture items and technology they still needed to make online learning feasible and successful in their homes. I'm reporting this not to boast about the work of UNEA, but rather to demonstrate the breadth of needs that families still have. In a survey we conducted with our community outreach participants, we asked what needs they still had. These were the most common responses. Further assistance with groceries and food, school supplies, assistance with transportation costs, including fuel, rent assistance, and reliable internet. In addition, we asked SBS parents and guardians what barriers they are currently facing within SBS in regards to online learning. These were the most common issues they brought up. Not having reliable enough Wi-Fi to participate in online learning effectively, not receiving the accommodations laid out by the student's IEP or 504 plans, teachers and administrators not responding to emails or calls, students not receiving enough individual support from teachers, and avoid an advocacy from Indian education. What will Indian Ed do to support these families, to better advocate for these students, and to connect these families to resources? We consistently hear from families that they have little to no communication from Indian Ed and do not feel the benefits of their advocacy. A few families have reported that Indian Ed has been helpful and provided them valuable assistance. This is great, um, but what has happened with all the, these families that say they haven't received any support or assistance? A focus on SDI training and PD is less important than finding resources to best meet survival needs of our students. We urge Indian Ed to bolster their efforts to reach Native families within SBS, and we urge SBS Board to require Hachusada to provide reports and Thank data you. on how they are providing direct assistance and support to Native students during COVID-19. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Uh, and thank you to our speakers and those who provided public comment today. We appreciate you joining us. Uh, a special shout out to our young people, our students for being here today as well. Really appreciate you speaking um, to the board today. So with that, uh, let's, let's first go to the items that were removed. Uh, Actually, first, let's go to finishing the board committee reports. Director Rankin, will you be able to provide a quick high-level um, two-minute update uh, from SSCNI? Sure. Um, 
I can do that. Let me, oops, I had brought up. Basically what, what you've been talking about in your last meeting and, and kind of the forecast for your next one. Um, well, so uh, a lot of what we're doing right now, you know, we have various standing items that come through and, and reports um, look back over different um, uh, programs and things, but the kind of um, exciting or more more uh, shareable information is that as we have been uh, as we have made the transition from curriculum and instruction curriculum and instruction policy committee to now the student services curriculum and instruction committee um, we're bringing up and and bringing under our umbrella a lot more of um, a lot more about the student the student experience and um, and the relationship between adults and students in our buildings. So um, we are making some exciting progress ar around uh, isolation and restraint, and um, and that is you know something that's uh, a policy on paper that could be you know changed in an instant. But the real the real work, of course, is the um, the experience of students and the the procedures once it gets out into buildings, and so uh, we've been talking a lot about alignment between departments and um, uh, in an internal work group to get all of those get us get us all on the same page. And and what's what's great is that uh, people are all on the same page, and there's a there's a broad understanding of the importance of of addressing this work. Um, uh, through the committee and bringing various partner uh, departments together around the work to talk about how best to support students, um, and that ties it ties in with uh, uh, the intersectionality of race and disability, and um, just general uh, students' se sense of safety and belonging, um, which leads me to sort of upcoming work, which is. Um, uh, inclusionary practice and policy, um, which will be coming probably more in the spring. Um, so we've got uh, isolation restraint. We also are working on um, threat assessment, which uh, would formally have been maybe under operations, but since we are focusing on uh, student experience and interaction with adults in the building um, beyond just curriculum, uh, the, the threat assessment is um, a policy to to look out for in terms of how you know how how we wrap around students who are in in um, in a situation where they are are demonstrating that they could be thinking about uh, doing things that are a threat a threat to others um, in a very serious way and how to approach that from a um, uh, a supportive and problem-solving space instead of as a instead of a, a disciplinary and punitive response, and so um, uh, what's what I'm proud of and and what I've really uh, um, been fortunate to be uh, to 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 witness and be part of work of staff um, in this committee is is moving from punitive to and reactive. Uh, to a whole child and um, and proactive, and so that's that's a little bit more <laughs> uh, broad than I I think people are maybe maybe expecting a list of items or whatever. But but that's kind of the what's happening right now in in our committee, and it's really exciting thinking about whole child health, um, identity safety, physical safety, and just. Um, Acknowledging that for students to do their best academic work, um, we need to do the work as adults to ensure that students can bring their whole selves to school and that they will be fully included members of the, the community in the classroom. Um, and of course, we've got uh, curricular stuff um, in, in the next couple months. We'll be hearing more about ethics studies and black studies and um, how that work is rolling out. And uh, so we have a lot going on in, in SSCNI. And um, I think that's that's probably plenty for the moment. Thank, thank you so much, Director Rankin. <laughs> uh, 
I appreciate that. <clears throat> um, Director Hampson, um, you are the final committee to share a report. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. can okay, great. Um, so in our last meeting, uh, we uh, looked at a number of um, board action reports, which we will be discussing at length today. So I won't go into any detail about that. They're all um, here in front of you. Uh, we didn't have any additional uh, items that were um, sort of introduction as it were. Um, we did look at our, our work plan um, in terms of uh, having really um, managed to get through the vast majority of what we set out to do this year. Um, with the, the exception of uh, policy 6114 as it pertains to, to gifts, grants, donations, and fundraising proceeds, um, that's a big lift, a really important lift in terms of taking a really strong look at, um, at that policy, particularly as it pertains to racial equity um, and other uh, other types of equity in our district. And it's a, it's a much um, bigger and more extensive process and is interwoven with a number of other uh, policies and procedures. And while we've been engaged, for example, with um, Seattle Council PTSA, um, the, you know, the, the council that, that is over all of the, the PTAs that do tremendous fundraising in this district um, about working on that, and we're anxious to do that work together. Uh, we really wanna make sure that um, we know what the full body of work is um, and that because this, this work is ripe for unintended consequences. So we all agreed um, as committee and as community that, that we would um, take that work on this next year. And I think it's appropriate given the, the broader uh, context that we've had to deal with during this current year. And then obviously we have the work of uh, participatory budgeting, the budgeting process as a whole and taking on for the first time the participatory budgeting, which is uh, just got started today with community. Um, it's the first time we're doing that, so uh, it's exciting. And of course, it's you know we're stumbling along uh, trying to make it happen. But I'm I'm grateful and proud um, of that work and open to talking to folks about that. Um, and uh, the board should have received uh, the documents that went to the community members participating in that uh, today. And um, and then we also did receive. Uh, we closed out what I'll call our first round of applications for the our public advisor position for the um, a public advisor to the audit and finance committee uh, and we'll start doing some interviews and then we're going to um, extend the the deadline so that we can get in a few more applications uh, to be able to fill make sure we can fill both positions um, we'll we'll uh, extend that to next friday and so if we can please get um, the word out about that that critical um, public voice in the um, audit and finance uh, capacity that would be great and then the work we're not fully under contract yet in the work for um, oh, and by the way, the application for that can be found on the main page of the of the um, uh, board um, page on the Seattle Public Schools website. And the um, work that we approved last board session around uh, restructuring um, uh, um, audit and in the internal audit uh, department, uh, so as to be a higher impact division. Um, is it quite under contract, but it's it's under review, so it should be under contract soon, and that work can then uh, get going. And um, unless I've forgotten anything critical that somebody wants to point out, I will leave it at that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Director Hampson. Okay, we will first move to the uh, items removed from the consent agenda. So we, uh, directors removed item number four, which was the uh, CBA for local 609 and another director removed the MOU with pass. So for each item, we need a motion. So we can start with item number four or the otherwise known as uh, CBA for local 609. So do I have a motion for that item? I move that the school board authorize the superintendent to execute the four CBAs with local 609 with the wage schedules and other amendments in the form of the draft agreements for the period September 1st, 2020 through August 31st, 2023 as attached to the school board action report with any minor additions, deletions, and modifications deemed necessary by the superintendent and to take any necessary actions to implement the contract. Immediate action is in the best interest of the district. Second the motion. Thank you. This item has been moved by Director Hampson and seconded by Director Harris. I'll first call on the director who removed this item from the agenda. And just as context, this came to the executive committee last 
Thursday, excuse me, for approval. We had a pretty good discussion there. So I will turn it over first to Director Mack, who removed this item. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I have several questions, but I think my first one uh, and uh, kind of the primary reason uh, for pulling it off of consent is to get some transparency and public just knowledge about what's in the 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 contract that we're being asked to um, approve. Uh, I think my first question is for um, Mr. Narver or maybe Ellie around. Um, uh, I, I was just kind of surprised to see a collective bargaining agreement on the consent agenda for intro and action. Um, and I don't recall that we had a closed session as a full board to discuss this. And I appreciate that it went through exec, but I'm uh, and I'm wondering if my memory is fuzzy here or if there's been a change in process in terms of how the board um, supports uh, the uh, process around uh, contracts and whether or not it's typical that we would have a closed session to have kind of understanding around the entire contract before it um, comes for uh, approval and whether or not we typically would actually have it introed um, publicly as opposed to on the consent agenda. That's uh, question number one. Okay. Uh, and, this and I would say, it, direct and Chief Council Marvin, if you could just keep this brief because I want to focus on the actual item. So please get this answer quickly so we can move to the actual item. Thank you. Or I'll try and answer quickly. Um, I'm not, uh, there's, there's no prohibition against uh, an item like this being on the consent agenda and directors have the ability to, to remove it. I think it's typical that it would be intro in action, but nothing precludes it being considered on consent. As far as a closed session, those are authorized. Uh, again, there's no requirement that a contract like this be briefed to the board in a closed session. That That's something that's, that's available and not subject to the OPMA. Um, Director Codd may know more about past practice on this, but there, it's not a requirement that the board be briefed in closed session, right? Uh, it has past practice been that we've had that though, because that's been my experience. I'm just curious whether or not um, the practice is changing going forward. Yeah. Director Mack, this is not indicative of a process change. This is just how it went today. Okay, um, great. Well, then my actual specific kind of questions around um, the uh, the proposal in front of us is around um, uh, what just getting clarity around whether or not their policy level determinations being made in the CBA that are um, either in alignment or out of alignment with our existing policies and procedures. Um, and specific to that, the um, number three, uh, I'm sorry, it's not number three, it's, but the, um, maybe it is on the, the, the table of contents, but the, the MOU around harassment, discrimination, and intimidation, or I'm sorry, maybe it's page 77, discrimination, retaliation, and HIB complaint investigation process, I think. I think there used to be an MOU if I was reading it properly and that's been stricken and it's been changed to a, uh, on uh, page 77, the discrimination, retaliation, and HIB complaint investigation process. And what I'm curious about is, because this goes into deep detail around um, you know, how those sorts of things are handled. And we have a policy on HIB um, as well as, I, I think we have procedures that are um, aligned with that. And they would include like the logging of the complaint, the intake, the acknowledgement of the complaint, the interview. And so that entire process, I'm wondering why, um, why this is all listed in a CBA when uh, that exists in policy, or is there in the CBA some difference for this specific group of employees that is not consistent with um, other groups of employees or our uh, policy and procedure? Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I, I, wanna, I do want to apologize. I understand that staff is 
hearing this question for the very first time because I didn't catch it until right before the meeting. And I still feel it's very important to ask that question because we are talking um, yeah. intently around student safety and all of these issues um, and our process and procedures, if they're dramatically different for different groups of people, I'm curious to know why and whether or not there's, yep. is there misalignment or is there alignment? Chief Codd's trying to answer, so Chief Codd, to you. Thank you. Hi, yes, thank you. So Clover Codd, Chief Human Resource Officer. So to directly answer your question, Director Mack, um, this is not in misalignment with our policies and procedures. It is in addition to, we have extra steps that we have to uh, take when we are going through the process with a member who is part of Local 609. So these are extra steps. It is not in conflict. Uh, and this was something that was agreed to a few years ago to help make it more clear to the member. Thank you, Chief Cott. Any final questions, Director Mack? Um, well, just a quick question as to why these extra steps wouldn't be important for other employees as well around these topics. It's, it, it, it feels like that is a misalignment if one group of employees has extra steps. I'm kind of curious why. It is not usual for one bargaining um, unit or labor partner to have different steps in a process or additional steps in a process from another. Um, again, we, we have made changes to the HIB and discrimination policies and procedures. Some of that came out of a conversation that we had with 609 um, early on before we made those changes, but this is a MOU that was made around the same time that provided these additional steps to 609 members. That is not unusual. Okay, and then uh, it's, uh, the other specific question related to that is that um, my understanding, and, and help me understand here, it's the superintendent that has the authority or the designee to place someone on leave or to, um, um, but, you know, all of the hiring and firing decisions ultimately lay with the superintendent or their designee. And in the document, it now states the chief human resource officer or designee. Why is that listed that way instead of the superintendent? Yes, um, thank you. The, there are different rules for certificated staff versus classified staff per RCW. Only the superintendent has the authority to terminate a certificated employee. Um, that is not the same case for classified employees. The superintendent designee, me, um, and I can also designate perhaps a director of labor relations can also that that it's just different RCWs that cover different types of employees. Thank you, Chief Cobb. Any final questions, Director Mack? No, I think that does clarify. I do just want to make the comment that it is concerning to me that we have uh, just from a systemic level that we have very different um, processes around responding to um, situations of discrimination, retaliation, harassment, intimidation, and bullying investigation. And I think that that is something that we on a systemic level need to take a deeper look at uh, in order to Thank support you. both staff and students um, in those issues. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll quickly go to directors. Director Hampson, any comments or questions for this item? Uh, none for me right now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Director Harris. Uh, yeah, comment. I I am the person that moved this to the consent calendar. No, this, Please. This, this. Go ahead. Mostly to show that this is a compliance item. Directors are not going to be uh, editing contracts from the dais, nor do you want us to when work has been done already. Um, and, and I appreciate the transparency argument made by my colleague, uh, Director Mack, but um, these come for us for rubber stamping. And I do believe we in fact had a closed session about where we were with 609 and the negotiations. I think she brought up beautiful points and I'm glad she took it off. Thank you. 
Thank you, Director Harris. And I just want to clarify, I do not view this personally as rubber stamping. This is still a part of our oversight, and I'm not a fan of that term. Director Hersey, any final comments or questions on this item? None for me. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rankin. No questions from me, thanks. Thank you, Director Devetta Smith. No questions, thank you. Thank you, Director Devetta Smith. And I have no questions at this time. All right, Ms. Wilson Jones, uh, the vote, please. Director Rivera Smith. Aye. Director Hampson. Aye. Director Harris. Aye. Director Hersey. Aye. Director Mack. Aye. Director Rankin. Aye. Director DeWolf. Aye. This motion has passed unanimously. Thank you, directors. All right, we'll next move to the, the next item, which was known as number five. Uh, and I will entertain the motion for this um, item. Uh, Director Harris, would you mind reading the motion for me? Thanks. Director Harris, are you able to make the motion? I'm still trying to get back to the page. Maybe someone else wants to take it on. Thank you. Okay. One moment, please. Is this item for the approval of the four successor collective bargaining agreements? I I can I can add it here. Um, yes, item this for pass. Yep. Okay. I move that the school board authorize the superintendent to enter a memorandum of understanding with PASS, known as the Principals Association of Seattle Schools, to amend the evaluation process in accordance with the OSPI evaluation guidelines for 2020 through 2021, also known as bullet bulletin number 06, 063-20, which is attached. Immediate in action is in the best interest of the district. Second, Second the most, Director Hampson. Nope. Thank you. Okay, this item has been moved by Director DeWolf and seconded by Director Hampson. I'll first call on the director who removed this item, which was Director Harris, and then I will move through the remaining directors for final comments or questions alphabetically. Director Harris, to you first. Thank you so much. Um, I heard from a principal today that is um, active with the executive board of PASS that PASS was surprised to see this on the agenda, let alone in uh, consent, which I advise of my reasoning. And I'm advised by a principal that uh, PASS apparently has additional edits and adds and that was unknown to me, and I believe the executive committee as of last Thursday. And I'm prepared to make a motion to table this to a time certain as to when SBS and PASS can meet again and um, finalize this and edit it if necessary. Thank you. Okay, so we'll move through director, starting with director Hampson. Director Hampson. Uh, yeah, I thought I was clear on this and um, and and now less so. And I, I know we got some recent communication from uh, Chief Codd. So uh, I would just ask Dr. Codd if you would want to um, rebrief us, I would appreciate it. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, Clover Cod here. So the intention behind this MOU was to make one small change to be in alignment with the August 7th, 2020 MO, uh, excuse me, memorandum that came out from OSPI that allowed for a comprehensive evaluation to be modified in this one school year due to COVID. Um, 
we negotiate with the executive director of CAS um, on, on all items, not individual principles. Um, PASS knew that this went to the executive agenda. PASS knew that this was communicated and that it would be sent agenda. And the fact that individual principles went around directly to directors is concerning to me. That is out of process. I communicate with the executive director of PASS when negotiating MOUs. Director Hampson, any comments or questions? Um, well, I, is, is pass on to make any comments? Is anyone from, is? I'm, I'm assuming by the silence, no? we don't have anybody from the Principals Association on this call. Okay, well, I guess I'll just let it go to the other director. That was the only question I had, so I'll let it go to the other directors then. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right, Director Hersey. I've got no questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Director Mack. Um, yeah, I'm a little confused. As to, again, I mean, I appreciate the uh, idea of why these are put on the consent agenda. Um, but it's, you know, when we when we had the uh, the other CBA in front of us the other day, we had a, a presentation and we had uh, the union also uh, representing and and, you know, uh, signaling their support for this change. Um, it's somewhat concerning to me to to hear um, that there isn't a representative from past to help respond to whether or not this MOU is um, in alignment and 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 that th there's been communication out of process and so I would support a potential motion on the table to table it um, to a time certain um, because it 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 feels uncomfortable at this point with that. Okay, thank you, Director Rankin. Uh. Um, I, I guess I don't have any question. I mean, it sounds like there's a miscommunication from within the past or some kind of misalignment between, uh, or, or, or uh, different expectations of what the change in the MOU was, um, and I also have um, uh, confidence in their executive director. So um, I, I guess I don't really have, <laughs> it, this is confusing, but I guess I don't actually have a question. Sorry. Thank you, Director Rankin. Director David S. Smith. Thank you. Um, I mean, it, it does feel, feel kind of weird to, to um, move on with move on vote on this item considering we don't know I mean it sounds like um, it would be beneficial to have their um, perspective here on this I I, I mean I, I'm sorry about that I, I understand that um, Dr. Codd is aware of um, changes they were they had been speaking about and if that was something that they were going to be negotiating on I would trust that she would have reached out or they would have reached out to her to do that um, so I mean I don't I I don't know if anyone wants to make a motion to table. I don't, I'm not sure if Dr. Mack was actually going to do that um, or if that's something. For now, um, again, like I too am very torn on this because I feel like I, I hate to pass it and then the pass, <laughs> no pun intended, um, comes back um, unhappy. So, uh, but um, but I guess with what we have at hand here is 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 what we. Um, it doesn't sound like there has been communications regarding movement on any changes. So um, I guess I don't have any questions. Thank you. Thank President you. Uh, just, uh, yes, Director Harris. I wanted to uh, read the email that Clover sent to us when I gave her the heads up that I would uh, be moving it from the consent agenda. 
Director Harris, management was also not aware that PASS was still working on additions to this MOU when it was presented at the exec committee. New paragraph. We were notified after the fact, dash, that PASS wanted additional changes. Those changes were substantive in nature and go above and beyond the recommendations from OSPI due to COVID. We have no intention of making substantive changes to the PASS evaluation section of our CBA. And let me know what time is appropriate to move this to a time certain, please. Uh, Chief Cod, did you like to respond? Yeah, I just wanted to add that the executive director of PASS was fully aware that um, and agreed that this was the MOU and the only change that we would need to make. So um, I, I suggest we table this to a time uncertain. So just as clarification, Chief Cod, if we move this to the December 2nd board meeting, would that be appropriate and enough time and provide enough flexibility to clarify some of these questions? Uh, I don't if know. At this point, I am just as astounded as you all are, so I, I actually don't know. Just of time, I will entertain a motion to move to the December 2nd meeting that gives two weeks to identify any remaining issues. Motion to move to the December 2nd meeting. Second. Thank you. Chief Counsel Narver, are we okay to just go through a vote and move to the second at, the, at this time? I, I, I believe so. Let, let me just talk this through for a second. This was originally on consent tonight for intro and action. It was taken okay. off of consent, but it is still an intro and action item. I think that the board can postpone further consideration of this to December 2nd, pending perhaps new information coming in from PASS about the status of this, but but it is certainly a permissible uh, motion to move this to the second and uh, take it up at that point if, uh, if in fact, the board chooses to do so. But that, that would be the appropriate motion for tonight. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me, sneezing. Um, I, I see we did hear a motion that, that it aligns with what you just described, and it was seconded by direct, excuse me, moved by uh, Director Hampson, seconded by Director Harris. Before we move to the vote, any final comment? I see your hand up, Director Rankin. Thank you. Yeah, um, well, one, one question I was going to ask is, is not really relevant anymore, but I was going to ask, you know, does approval of the item uh, mean that amendment, you know, amendments or a reopen or couldn't happen later? But since we're already talking about moving it, my second question is, what are the implications? Uh, I mean, if this is an MOU that was being negotiated between the district and the Principals Association, um, what are the implications in terms of, uh, I guess, further bargaining? I mean, they're not a union, they're an association. So I, I, I guess what, you know, between now and December 2nd, what happens and what are we, opening up to all right great chief cod has her hand up i'll let her answer this before we move to the vote chief thank Cole. you so this is not a mandatory subject of bargaining for the principals association um we do not have a reopener on the collective bargaining agreement or the evaluation section we have a collective bargaining agreement with pass for the net with three more years on that this was meant to be one change not a total reopener. So I will go back and work with the executive director of PASS to see what steps she'd like to take next. But we, we were not in negotiations, if you will. Okay. So this Thank was a, it was a, an, an adjustment to an existing agreement. Correct. In the current context, but not a full negotiation. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Wilson Jones, the roll call vote, please. Um, calling the roll on the vote um, to move this item to December 2nd, just for clarity. Um, Director, Director Harris. Aye. Director Hersey. Uh, aye. Director Mack. Aye. Director Rankin. Aye. Director R Rivera Smith. Aye. Director Hampson. Aye. Director DeWolf. 
abstain. This motion has passed by a vote of six yes to one abstention. Thank you, Ms. Wilson Jones. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, we can now move to our action items on today's agenda. Um, thank you, directors, for um, uh, the great discussion so far. Okay, so item number, action item number one. Um, and before, excuse me, before we move to the action items on today's agenda, I, I do want to just remind you of the process. I will call first on committee chairs uh, during the items, and then I'll call on the remaining al directors alphabetically for final comments or questions. So the first item we'll move to is action item number one. This is the annual approval of schools per WAC 180-16-220. This came through the Student Supports Curriculum and Instruction Policy Committee on September 15th for approval. May I have a motion for this item, please? I move that the school board approve each school building within the district within the district, and that each school has a school improvement plan that is data driven, promotes a positive impact on student learning, and includes a continuous improvement process pursuant to Washington. Uh, I'm the brain lost it. Whack. Okay. Thank you. Administrative code 180-16-220. Thank you. Second the motion. Thank you, directors. This item has been moved by Director Hampson and seconded by Director Harris. This item has been updated. So Chief of Schools and Continuous Improvement Wife, Jesse, I believe you will be briefing us on updates before I move to directors. Thank you so much, Board President DeWolf. Yes, the update uh, was in the a recommended motion itself uh, per our conversation last month. Um, uh, directly in the WAC, as Director Hampson was referring to, that's up here on the screen. Um, when you do approve the annual approval of schools, uh, it also includes that the fact that the, each of those listed schools needs to have a continuous improvement plan. So that was the language that was shifted in the recommended motion. I move that the school board approve each school building within the district, uh, that each school has a school improvement plan that is data driven, promotes a positive impact on student learning and includes a continuous improvement process pursuant to the WAC listed here. Um, and so then we uh, uh, go ahead and made a recommendation or was a request by the school board that we also uh, perform two particular actions. One is um, uh, significant. Um, and so that significant uh, change was to update the CSIPs reflective uh, for the 2021 school year. Um, again, within COVID-19, there's been uh, somewhat of a uh, delay in uh, the CSIP process, uh, but we were able to do that. So all of the school uh, leaders and their teams um, updated this, the CSIPs uh, and then uh, were able to, which was the second item, was to get them uh, posted onto the website. So we were able to create a single website uh, that also listed, um, uh, has each CSIP uh, on the school district in addition to each school's website itself. So those are the uh, significant portions of the changes that were part of the conversation um, in the board meeting uh, back in October. So with that, I'm happy to take any uh, questions um, uh, at this point. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chief Jesse. I'll now move to directors for comments or questions before we move to the vote. And we'll begin with our student services instruction and curriculum committee chairperson, Director Rankin. Um, I don't have any further, further questions. Just as a reminder, this came before us before and the approval is that plans are in place and we didn't not not all the plans were um, current. And so as a reminder to directors and to let the public know there were some um, some MOUs or sorry MOUs. Ugh. School uh, <laughs> CSIPs. Golly um, that had been updated and distributed to us via Friday memo as well as um, the information that Chief Jesse just shared. 
Thank you, Director Rankin. All right, move to Director Hampson. Um, no questions in particular with respect to, um, you know, what this is. I think the, um, just a comment for next year um, that I'm hoping, whether it's connected to this or some other appropriate, um, uh, you know, board action area that we have, or work session that we have the opportunity to look at the variance in utilization um, of BLTs and the makeup of those BLTs, the the level of engagement um, that that gives gets us at tier two and tier three for consult and collaborate. Um, you know what is that variability? Um, how 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 great is it? Um, and what can we do to make sure that it we're solidly in in the collaborate? Um, category for the development of the of the continuous school improvement plans. Um, I recognize that's not necessarily what we're approving, but um, it's information that I think would be really useful relative to what I believe was the intent of this um, administrative code, but um, for discussion at a later at a later date. But if um, Chief Jesse, if you could please uh, note that I would appreciate it um, for a future conversation. Thank you. No problem. We have a work session uh, uh, in the spring. We can uh, on this topic, so it'd be great. Thank you. All right. Next up is Director Harris. First of all, I want to give gratitude to Chief Jesse, to Director Executive Director Mike Starofsky, and to Director Carrie Hansen for what appears to be in 20 spot checks. A uh, significant lifting of the work and adding addendums. These are very different, and I'm pleased that they're very different from what was presented to us um, September, October. And, and we have an interesting history on this. I am prepared to vote yes. I do have a question as to whether or not the BLTs and the peer review processes was used between late September and uh, what's presented to us now. So Director Harris, the process, uh, they were, um, there was many things in draft. Um, as you know, again, as I mentioned um, previously that the COVID-19 delayed a lot of things. We were waiting to see in their plans if they were, we were gonna do remote or if we're gonna do hybrid. Um, obviously we weren't gonna do uh, full in-person at that time. So there was a lot of waiting to see and how they could adjust those plans. So they were working with their BLTs. Uh, they were working in a peer review. Um, principals work in their professional learning networks, talking about that. And then what did transpire over the last uh, six, seven weeks was, a, uh, was that shift that you're mentioning, the significant shift of not only just finalizing it, working with their BLTs, uh, yes they did, and then turning around and making sure they had an addendum that did reflect uh, the remote learning playbook. Thank you ever so much. Thank you, Director Hersey. Uh, no, we discussed this uh, at length in committee, so I am good to go. Thank you, Director Mack. Hi, thank you. I, um, I, I also appreciate the updating of the uh, the bar to reflect that this is our annual approval of school buildings. I do want to make one point that I think is actually kind of important to recognize because we have these issues come up all the time. Our buildings actually have different names still than our schools um, in many cases. And so the list here is actually of the schools, but it's not referencing the building name that they're in. Um, so I just want to make note of that for the record that um, there is uh, a lots of confusion that happens in this list when you try to cross reference it to other lists like um, uh, uh, the actual building name. Um, and uh, I appreciate that the address is provided and the number is provided. So that creates a little bit of clarity, but um, there's still a disconnect of information here about the difference of building names and school names. Um, and that's not reflected in this document. 
Um, <clears throat> however, I still am happy to approve it. The other thing I want to actually raise was uh, an issue that was brought up in testimony around like the curricular focus of a school or what I see is noted in the CSIP specifically is called the school profile. And I want to raise a concern, an ongoing concern I have and have had for many, many years is that we have schools that start with a specific profile, they're adopted as a you know specific curricular focus, and then over time that might get lost or changed. And and um, in my understanding, that would this would be the appropriate place where the clarity around that focus is provided um, in the CSIP because it defines the school profile. And I just want to highlight a couple examples of um, difference in how the information is presented here and also perhaps some inconsistency on whether or not a profile of a school or the curricular focus has been maintained over time. Um, when we look at the school profile for McDonald International School, it is uh, specifically a language immersion school offering a curriculum infused with global awareness and cultural competence at every grade level, et cetera, et cetera. And it says specifically Jan Sp Spanish and Japanese. So that's clarified that this school has a very specific focus. Uh, when we look at Lichten Springs, however, the profile doesn't actually talk about the curricular focus. It talks about the population. Um, and um, it also doesn't reference the previous uh, designation as, um, and I'm, uh, there's lots of different uh, ways that this has been said in, in the past, but native focus or Indian heritage, or I'm not sure exactly what the terminology was, but that's not referenced in the CSIP. Um, we have a lot of other schools that also have specific focus that, um, you know, I haven't had the time to go through and see whether or not they're uh, accurately represented in the CSIPs, but it is concerning to me that uh, Licton Springs in particular no longer has the uh, focus that was previously um, uh, designated um, and uh, more of a comment than a question at this point because uh, I understand that this we need to move forward but I do think that it's important uh, that we re elevate the clarity around our schools that have specific curricular focus and um, continue to support that as time goes on. Thank you. Director Rankin. I, I started, I don't have anything else. You're right, thank you. Director Rivera Smith. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, no, I wanna appreciate um, Director Max um, pointing out of the uh, Licton Springs profile lacking the native focus that was, um, and I need to probably do more research on it, but it feels like that what sounds like that was our commitment to the school. Um, and I know um, there's a lot at play there, but but it is something that I have heard from community about, and we want to um, address those concerns at some point. I know this is not exactly the time right now. Um, I appreciate that this is about approving these buildings. Um, I know we had a lot of talk in committee regarding the CSIPs um, and what those meant and um, somewhere along the lines, I, I do want to see us sort of codify that um, BLT should have student representatives on them. Um, I know they're allowed to, but it's not it's not mandated um, so much. So anyway, that's um, conversations for another time. Um, I have no other questions or hands. I do thank um, Director, I mean, sorry, Chief Jesse for um, all the additions he got into the bar at our request. No further questions. Thank you. Okay, I have no questions at this time. We've discussed this at length. I appreciate the updates. So Ms. Wilson-Jones, roll call vote, please. Director Mack. Aye. Director Rankin. Aye. Director Rivera-Smith. Aye. Director Hampson. Aye. Director Harris. Aye. Director Hersey. Aye. Director DeWalt. Aye. This motion has passed unanimously.
Thank you, Ms. Wilson-Jones. Thank you, directors. We will now move to action item number two. This is the approval of the Memoranda of Understanding MOUs for a bonus for working on site during the COVID-19 pandemic in spring 2020 between Seattle Public Schools, known as the district, and the following labor unions. International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 609, Seattle King County Building and Construction Trades Council, the Pacific Northwest Regional Council of Carpenters, the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, Local 117, and the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, Local 174. This came to the Executive Committee on November 12th for approval. So may I have a motion for this item, please? I move that the school board approve the MOUs for a bonus for working on site during the COVID-19 pandemic in spring 2020 with Local 609, the Trades, the Carpenters 117 and 174. Immediate action is in the best interest of the district. Second the motion. Thank you, directors. This item has been moved by Director Hampson and seconded by Director Harris. This item is on the agenda for introduction and action today. Chief Human Resources Officer, Dr. Clover Codd, I believe you will be briefing us. Yes, thank you so much, President DeWolf. Um, we're really excited to be able to bring this board action uh, report to you tonight. This MOU uh, for each of these labor partners calls for a bonus for essential employees whose job duties required them to be on site during the initial phases of the pandemic. The parameters of the bonus um, are such that all employees who worked on site at least 75% of the work days between March 23rd and June 30th will receive a one-time non-precedent setting bonus of $1,000. Uh, there are approximately 487 employees who qualify for this bonus with a fiscal impact of $604,416. We are really proud of these employees and their continued commitment to be on site and, and ensure that essential duties, operations are maintained. It allows us to provide meals uh, to our students and families, supplies to our students and families, keep our buildings sanitized, functioning, and safe. So thank, I, I really just want to give a thank you to the employees and to Tom Polis, the Director of Labor Relations, who negotiated this with the five different labor partners. That concludes my remarks. Thank you, Chief Cod. Appreciate it. All right. So we will begin with uh, directors' uh, comments and questions as the Executive Committee Chair. Uh, I, will, I don't have any additional questions. Uh, we did put this on the... Uh, we, excuse me, just as again, for, for further context, we did send this to the board for approval. Um, we had a really great discussion about this. Appreciate that, Dr. Codd. Um, I will now turn it over to Director Hampson for uh, final comments or questions before we move to the vote. Uh, no additional comments or questions from me. Um, I'm happy to um, provide this. Uh, not enough, but uh, modest. Um, uh, indication of our gratitude for um, their work. Thank you. Thank you. Director Harris. Uh, the same conversation that we had in executive committee, this does not include the same folks moving forward. This is just for last school year. And I wish the heck we had the money to give it to them for this school year because they're still there and they're still working hard and I cannot say how much I appreciate same. Thank you. Thank you, Director Harris. Director Hersey. Uh, no additional questions, just a huge, I mean, we, a thousand dollars cannot express how thankful so many of us are in our system for uh, these, these members that have been showing up ever since uh, Seattle has been wrecked by our pandemic. So just a, just a huge thank you. Excited to move this forward. Thank you, Director Mack. Yeah, I don't have any questions. Um, happy that this uh, has been negotiated and appreciate all of the uh, incredibly difficult work. Um, and um, thank you. Thank you, Director Mack. Uh, Director Rankin. Thank you. Um, I'm I'm so uh, glad to see this um, come through for action. I know that you know the the possibility of trying to to recognize and um, compensate 
employees had had been a discussion that we weren't sure if it was going to um, be possible. And so I'm just I'm really glad to see this. I know, um, as I think Director Harris said, you know, this is really uh, this is for, for last spring um, when, you know, no, so many things are still uncertain. But when really n nobody knew everything was new and different and very, very, very uncertain. And these folks, um, you know, in spite of all of that, continued to um, do the do the work in person, um, feed feed families and students at lunch sites, um, keep the buildings clean and and um, secure and, and and all these other things um, at a time when a lot of us were going, you know, what is this? What is this? <laughs> What's going to happen now? Um, and so, yeah, as Director Hansen said, I, I wish it could be more, but i um, really glad that we're able to um, uh, show our, our appreciation and recognize um, uh, the hard work of these folks. Yeah. Thank you so much, Director Rankin. Director Vivetta Smith. Hi, I don't know if I can say it any better, but yes, very thankful and grateful that we can do this um, for our, our partners uh, in the work we're doing. And um, I know some personal friends of mine who will be <laughs> very thankful for this because they've been hard workers in our nutrition services and um, facility services. So uh, I have no questions. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Ms. Wilson-Jones, vote. roll call vote, please. Director Rankin. Aye. Director Rivera-Smith. Aye. Director Hampson. Aye. Director Harris. Aye. Director Hersey. Uh, aye. Director Mack. Aye. Director DeWolf. Aye. This motion has passed unanimously. All right, thank you, directors. We are. We will begin our uh, next section, which is our introduction items. We have about, I think it's 17, 17 items. Um, and so we'll begin with introduction item number one. This is the approval of the 2021, excuse me, 2020 through 2021 District Educational Research and Program Evaluation Plan. This came to the Student Supports Curriculum and Instruction Policy Committee on October 13th for consideration. Uh, Chief Academic Officer, Dr. Diane DeBacker, I believe you will begin with briefing us and then I'll move to directors for comments and questions. Thank you, President DeWolf. Um, in accordance with board policy 2090, this board action report introduces the 2020-2021 District Educational Research and Program Evaluation Plan for approval by the school board. As you may recall, policy number 2090 was revised in 2018. It provides that our annual plan be reviewed by the board for formal approval each year, and that we share the summary reports from previous years with the school board. So consistent with that obligation, the reports completed for last year have been uploaded to the district website on the Department of Research and Evaluation webpage and we will provide a direct link to this webpage in this week's Friday memo to the school board. The 2020-2021 plan identifies the initiatives and programs to be set, studied by the research and evaluation department under the leadership of Dr. Eric Anderson and in partnership with district staff who lead these programs and initiatives and in cons consultation with our community partners and stakeholders. We would like to point out and we thank uh, Director Rivera Smith for uh, calling our attention to two typos that are within the research report. And I think it was a subliminal message that we were sending there, but you'll find 2019, 2020 listed in two places. At the top of the organizational chart on page eight, that should say 2020, 2021. And then the heading on page nine. Again, we apologize for those two typos and we thank Director Rivera-Smith for letting us know about those. 
Uh, this year's research will continue to focus on our strategic plan and will include continuing support for third grade reading and ninth grade on track credit goals. Our research and evaluation team will work with the math department to assist with our fifth grade and seventh grade math goal and will continue its support for the team working on safe and welcoming schools, including support for two initiatives funded by federal grants. You can read about those on page six. One is through the CDC and one is through the Department of U.S. Department of Education. For our culturally responsive workforce goal, research and evaluation will continue its partnership with the University of Washington to conduct research around educator diversity and retention and culturally responsive teaching practices. This year, we will also conduct multi-year evaluations of our curriculum adoptions. You're very familiar with those in ELA, math and science to support the ongoing analysis of the implementation across schools. The ELA formal evaluation is actually completed, but we'll continue to do follow-up survey questions with um, our program evaluation with teachers this coming year. New for this year, we will lead two multi-year evaluation studies to be launched um, with working in collaboration with the Office of African American Male Achievement under the direction of Dr. Mia Williams. We'll design and execute a multi-year evaluation plan, and we'll also work with the Advanced Learning Department to develop a multi-year study of our district's efforts to develop a more equitable and diverse, highly capable program. Finally, we will help the, with the, the Remote Learning Task Force to monitor the implementation of remote learning. For example, and as you're aware of, we'll be conducting the Pulse surveys for students, families, and staff and share those feedback on their school experiences. You'll get a full report of that in this year's Friday or this uh, week's Friday memo. Um, in developing this year's plan, the research and evaluation conducted initial engagement with district staff, outside research partners. We also had many community stakeholders that will continue to be consulted as we work on our evaluation plan. Um, Last year, the research and evaluation team regularly participated in community work groups for the third grade reading, for the safe and welcoming schools, and for culturally responsive workforce. We'll continue to do that as we gather um, information and data. Um, I think finally I'll end it up that um, uh, you'll recall that Dr. Anderson presented summary findings from last year's research to the culturally responsive workforce group he is cur currently working with our advanced learning department um, to determine best, better ways to regularly engage our community stakeholders. And I believe with that, as I look through my notes, um, I'm open for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chief DeBacker. Okay, we'll begin with our SS CNI committee chairperson, Director Rankin first. Um, thank you. I, I do not have anything to add at this time. I would be happy to see if um, other directors have questions. Okay, thank you, Director Hampson. Hi, thank you. Uh, so, I continue to struggle with this. I know we had this presented to us um, prior to, I don't recall exactly when, but I know we have looked at this um, in a work session um, or maybe it was during a um, uh, data dashboard session. And I'm struggling to connect it um, To, to anything really. I mean, I, I see that it's a, it's, we're looking at, we're at doing research and evaluation on particular areas, particular projects, timelines. Um, I, I, I think part of the reason I struggle with it is I don't see how this necessarily, um, in terms of research and evaluation, what is, what what is the goal of this research and its evaluation 
in these particular areas. I think that that that's something that that I'm struggling to see spoken to. Like, what what are we looking to get out of these research areas? What are we trying to decide? We're yeah. Looking at these things, and when we look at um, particularly, sorry, I'll, I'll let you answer that in a second. But the um, the many of these things are very just they're mostly very distinct and then you have something like school climate surveys which is broad and longitudinal and so i i can't reconcile those two things in terms of who who's using this and to what end and how are we as policymakers um supposed to see the value in this because i know that we don't get the information we feel that we need with respect to policymaking and, and then I'm just going to note, because I've been saying it for years now, and we're now down to 220 some Native students from 500 just a year ago, or two years ago, um, with complete mismatch between the data that we have that comes out of research and evaluation, and the number of 506 forms that we get. Um, and so I'm not confident in the demographic data from a starting point. Um, and at the same time, we're, we're also starting to disaggregate, which is great. Um, and I thank you all for that disaggregate in terms of students for this from educational justice and, and the Asian and Pacific Islander category, but I can't really see all of that. It's not transparent. And, and, um, I really need to see a lot more actual quantitative, um, data. And I, I need for somebody to get that, that reconciled with respect to, to our, our native population in, in sale public schools, because it's been wrong for a very, very long time. Um, so uh, th those are kind of two or three distinct um, issues that give me a great deal of pause in terms of being able to approve this. Go ahead, yeah. Um, yeah. Mr. Becker. Yeah, thank thank you, Director Hampson, and I I will at attempt to answer it um, from from my knowledge at this point. With any research and evaluation team that you have in a district of this size, there's a multitude of things that they could do. And what we have found over the years and what I understand and why the policy was was looked at and, and um, changed some back in 20, um, a few years ago, is that this really helps to identify what we're going to study up front so that we have identified the resources that are needed to get it done, that we don't overstretch our team, that we don't go to them with just, oh, hey, can you guys study this? And I, I know I'm saying it more casual than it really happens, but um, that we're trying to make sure that what we are doing our research on is, is centered around what the goals of the district are. And so that's why you see a very heavy emphasis on what is included in the strategic plan. Um, because we, we do, we truly have to look at everything that we could study every year and decide what we can study and what actually can help us as we move the district forward. In your, your, your question, we, I've heard you ask this before of more quantitative data, especially around our native students and our native numbers. We continually are working on that. I think we're getting better, better at it. We're certainly not there. Um, and we, um, we, we hear you in terms of that, that we need to continue to work on that. But I think I'll, I'll stop at that point. I think the other thing that would help or, or it would be very helpful um, and we just loaded these on the website, so it's not like anybody should have already looked at these. But looking back at what we did last year, I think gives a very clear picture of, of the, um, the scope of what we're looking to do this year. I'll stop there. Okay, and I could do follow up or I can connect with you offline in terms of kind of just some of the statements that would help me in this, because I feel like I, in each of these areas, like I read through it and I'm like, okay, so I get the general idea of what they want to do, but I still don't really know why. And, sure. And, and I don't even mean, yeah, clearly it's related to the strategic plan, but there still has to be a why. And so I'll, I'll, I'll let other directors um, ask their questions, but, but I, I think that it's not, um, it's not as strong as it could be. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Director Hampson. Director Harris. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, comment and a few questions. Um, I guess, and no offense to Dr. DeBacker, because I think you're the bomb. Um, <laughs> I would like to have heard from Eric Anderson and folks that have their boots on the ground and that are actually doing the work uh, for the touch points. And, and I appreciate that that is a superintendent um, preference. But every time I hear from Eric Anderson and Dr. Beaver, Jessica Beaver, I learn so very much. Uh, so I guess I'd like to see and hear from the folks boots on the ground as well as their supervisor yourself. Uh, Question. On, on number eight, we have an org chart and we have a vacancy. Yes. And if we are, in fact, are a data-driven district, A, why do we have a, a vacancy? B, how long has that vacancy been there and what are we doing to fill it? Because when I look at research and evaluation, and I think back to some of the bad old days where we made significant curriculum changes, but we didn't set up research and evaluation with them in terms of, oh, I know, uh, honors instead of AP tracks, et cetera, which, which is obviously and rightly so a hot button issue, but we didn't align the two to get real data longitudinal feedback. So, so I'm concerned that this um, department is under, uh, what's the word, under budget, under peopled, to do what we need to do to turn the corner on several of these extraordinarily important initiatives. Yeah, uh, 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 Director Harris, uh, this is Diane DeBacker, now known as the bomb. So thank you. I have a, don't think I've ever been to, referred to as that. So thank you for a first there. Um, we, uh, I agree with you, Dr. Eric Anderson can speak to this much better than I can. Um, we will definitely, we can set up a meeting with you and him. Um, he's, he's also on the line here tonight if, uh, if the president so chooses to ask him to visit about it, but I'll, I'll let that sit for a minute. Uh, on the org chart, that vacancy is there because, um, we had, there was that, you had, Eric had a full um, full organization until just a, a couple months ago. Um, the person who was in that position actually had the opportunity to move to a higher position within the agency, and so that was good. So we still have her, Dr. Jane Barker, in, in Seattle Public Schools, but she's in a different org chart right now. Um, and Eric has interviewed for that position, uh, for that vacancy, and we are very, very close to being able to say that it's filled, but not quite yet. Thank you. President DeWolf, do we have a moment to hear from um, Director Anderson, Dr. Anderson? Yes, briefly. Is is Dr. Anderson on the on the line today tonight? Um, he's actually. I was. I spoke incorrectly. Unless he's hopping on here real quick, he's not on the line. But he is watching it on YouTube. So I apologize. I misspoke. Okay. Any other questions, Director Harris? No, I'm good. I just want this to be aligned with what our initiatives are and to properly staff it and budget it. So if we are in fact a data driven district, we actually get extraordinary data. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll, and, we'll set and, up a and Dr. Encourage him to be at our next meeting. That would be probably very, very helpful. Will do. Thanks. All right, next up is Director Hersey. Yeah, I guess the only questions that I have are concerning once we've collected this data, what is the like storage, the use case? I, I really am pretty concerned about uh, our various data uh, agreements across the district. I know that this is uh, mostly internal, but I, I would like to get a little bit of understanding around like what, what is the life of this data once we've collected it? How do we utilize it? 
and like where is it stored, all that kind of stuff. If you could just give me just a two sentence uh, catch up on that, I would really appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Director Hersey. It, um, the, the data is stored in, in many different places. Um, we will find it uh, through our business intelligence group. Um, so I, I spoke about that Dr. Jane Anderson moved from our research and evaluation team to another team. She moved to our business intelligence group. Intelligence group. So as you, uh, if, if, if you recall within this particular research plan, we have the ninth grade on track. So one of the things that we're doing in that particular goal is we are developing an early warning system so that um, instead of our high school counselors and our high school registrars having to look through thousands of individual transcripts, it's actually on a, on a dashboard and on a, on something that um, that that we can vis visibly look at, and at a glance we can see that Diane Tobacco is not on track um, at the end of ninth grade. So that is that's an example of where something might be stored is within that um, w within that big warehouse of storage that we can pull from at any time for a variety of, of things. If you recall at the beginning or at, when we started remote learning in March, one of our goals was to make sure that all of our African-American male seniors were on track to graduate and made sure that they could finish and pass their classes. We were able to pull that data that came right out of the work that we've done on the ninth grade on track and also the college and career readiness goal. So those are just two examples of how we use that on the go, depending on what, what we need it for. And those are very two prime examples. Yeah, thank you for that. That makes a lot of sense to me. And it, I guess what I really want to um, understand is like, as we move forward with this process, what are our data uh, protection uh, systems that are in place? How, how can we guarantee that this is um, being kept and is not, what are we doing to protect ourselves against breaches, I guess? Um, would be my, my main question. Um, I, I'm gonna answer it briefly here, but I think it probably we, we deserve for you and, and for those listening here today, um, a more detailed explanation in the Friday memo, but we have very strict protocols for data security, data management and data sharing. Um, we, um, you know, as I talked about the partnerships that we have with the University of Washington, with those, um, collaborative projects with um, uh, that are, are grants through CDC and the U.S. Department of Ed. All of those have to go through our legal department as to whether or not um, we can share the information. There's no identifiable student data that's shared. But Eric, we can write something up for, may not be this Friday's memo, but maybe next Friday's. Um, we won't do one next Friday because it's, th it's Thanksgiving holiday. But we will get that to you, um, but just know that we, um, you know, we're we're under very strict protocols for that. Yeah, early December is perfectly fine. I, I look okay. forward to that, um, and I'll end my questions there. Thank you. Thank you, Director Mack. I'm a big data geek, and I really appreciate. Uh, data and analysis and I, I really appreciate the, the work of this um, this department and that we we have it I, I share just as a, a brief preview I do have a number of questions um, but the the what director Hersey was talking about about data security and uh, uh, student safety around their data um, I, I share the concerns around then continued vigilance um, that we have some things in place. Uh, but I, I think it's very important that we continue to maintain that focus. Um, what I want to first touch on, and I'm going to go backwards because it's actually probably the more uh, dramatic one around the um, strategic plan goal, safe and welcoming schools, the three different uh, projects that are um, noted here, I think are interesting, but I'll, you know, Director Hampson was saying, I don't really understand the why um, and, you know, it's been said by someone else, I don't recall who, but, you know, we need to measure what matters 
in order to actually understand it. And um, when I think about the safe and welcoming schools and the 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 things that we are hearing about and knowing about are incidents of harm or accidents or other things that are going on in our schools that, uh, you know, incidents of racism, incidents of discrimination, inc these incidents of harm to our students are the antithesis of safe and welcoming schools. So I'm, I'm curious about why or if it's even possible to start considering that maybe we need to start um, keeping track of the number of reported incidents of uh, these type and actually, uh, you know, figure out how, how much is going on and how is it being responded to? Um, of course, with student safety and of their data privacy, but I'm wondering whether or not that is something that um, might be something we should consider. Question one. Um, Director Mack, I will, um, of the of the items that are listed under the safe and welcoming schools, I, I it might relate a little bit to what you've asked, but you know, one of the ones that we're working on is this, um, this grant that we got, not that we got, that Dr. Lisa or Lisa Love um, in our district secured this grant to study the um, initiatives focused on sexual health education and services and safe and supportive environments. And it directly aligns with the um, resolution that the board passed a while back around LGBTQ students. And so it was perfect timing um, for that. Um, the other one that is through the US Department of Ed is all about how we help support students and create safe and welcoming school climates. Um, so again, if you think back to our strategic plan, that's one of our major initiatives. And so another, it aligns perfectly. And the beauty of all of these is that it's not just this small research and evaluation team, as Director Harris pointed out, doing this work. We now have partners all over helping us from UW, from the other places that are involved with these other grants. And so uh, it's a collective effort for us and, and really does help to not only um, enhance our work, but also amplify our work and what we're doing in Seattle Public Schools um, and across this nation. And then of course we do the school climate surveys. This year we're doing those a little bit differently in that we're doing pulse surveys. And, and you you read heard a little bit about those pulse surveys in last week's Friday memo. You'll hear much more about them in this week's Friday memo of um, you know how how our families, how our students, how our staff how we're all doing with remote learning. Um, so I'll, I'll answer it there. I know that um, I think uh, Chief um, Jesse is still on since the safe and welcoming is under uh, uh, most of the work with he and Pat Sander. He may be able to answer a little bit more about specifics of what you're asking in terms of- No, could, that's, could, okay. That, that's okay. I think that I just wanna make it and, and make the point for the record that if, these studies are not actually considering um, incidents um, and tracking that as part of the data that they're considering, then they're not looking at all the information that needs to be looked at. So I just would encourage that that be um, considered. The other piece I have, the other questions I have are related to specific data um, and concerns around, um, as was alluded to by other directors, the accuracy of the demographic data. I know that personally, when I went in to fill out the forms for my three kiddos, um, the forms were very confusing. And I just, it was, I, I really wonder whether or not we actually have very accurate information. Um, and um, secondly, and I don't know that this has to be answered here. I just, I guess I would appreciate it to be answered when reports are provided to us about how you know confident we are in the demographic data as as it as it stands um, um, but the biggest question i have around the 
like the validity of the data that we're using is how exactly are we going to be measuring third grade reading, fifth grade math, and seventh grade science when we're not doing standardized testing? It, what's the other mechanism to, to gain that information at this point in time? Yeah, we um, thank you for asking that question because we've been um, talking about that uh, quite a bit uh, of late. Um, as you may recall, we uh, when we first started school, we started with Strong Start. We, we ask our teachers to not even think about doing anything academic for the first couple of weeks, get to know the student, get to know, you know, uh, get to know them. Um, and then work on that. So after after that strong start, we then ask our teachers to use any curriculum embedded assessments. So in any of our adopted curricular areas, so with CCC, with our science, um, with the math uh, one adoptions that we've had, we said look within those look within those. Um, adopted curricular areas and use the assessments that are included there. In layman's terms, this means use the pre and the post test that comes before and after each unit. I mean, that's that's as sophisticated as it is. We know that that's not enough. So we are now going to be using um, the Smarter Balanced Interim Assessments. Um, that will be uh, required of all grades three through eight. Um, and um, so we'll be able to use those. We're going to require that they be administered twice a year. We are um, still hopeful that we'll be back in um, in-person learning in the spring by the time the Smarter Balance Summative Assessments could be, could be administered. So we'd have a third data point there. Um, of course, that will not be our call. Um, if uh, OSPI has already asked for a waiver from that, from the U.S. Department of Ed, they've not heard back about that. Um, and then, of course, we know that there will be a change in administration here soon. So, you know, maybe after the first of the year, we'll hear more. Um, but that's, that's where we're at with that right now. And Director Mack, it's really important that we have those not only for school CSIPs, because every C school CSIP has a goal set in there in terms of around math and reading at the very minimum, and then also for our 30 levy schools. They have to, uh, they, they have accountability that they have to, to meet as well in, um, with, within their um, grants that they received. Thank you, Dr. DeBecker. Yeah, I'm done, thank Let's you, see. and I appreciate all that. Thank, thank you. you. Director Rankin. Oh, excuse me, Director Rivetta Smith. <laughs> no worries. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm on. I'm got a reconnection here. Um, thank you, um, Chief Director, for um, not being too freaked out when I called earlier and saying, "Hey, can I talk to you?" It was this. I I re I read this bar way too close. I swear to God, I I have. I, I'm going to email you some more time, <laughs> but I'm not going to waste time here with those. But um, there was, uh, yeah, I was, I was really intrigued. I'm, I'm very intrigued um, with this, with this work we're doing in this department's um, goals and and methods and everything about it. So I was reading through. I have a couple uh, lingering questions I will ask. Um, let me scroll to them here. I under so which one is a strategic plan year two a strategic plan focus goal third grade reading. Um, in the, um, the bullet points there, engaging families and communities, building P3 practitioner capacity, um, we get to establishing early learning pathways. And I was wondering if you could tell me more about that, because we up above it does say, you know, building P3, which is preschool. So I want to know, does this include, uh, does this establishing early learning pathways include um, pre-K and, and work there, or at least um, research there? Yes. Can you tell me about that? Yes. Yes, we, we are in, including pre-K, and in fact, uh, Kishel Toner, um, Executive Director of Curriculum Assessment and Instruction, has, uh, has even uh, asked that, uh, she's asked me to then work with others across the agency to, as we look at all policies that say K through 12, that we try to get those to say pre-K through 12, because we obviously Yay. are <laughs> it's focused on pre-K through 12. And, and many of you know that 
the, the history of that for, for many, many years, that not only here in Seattle, but in, across the nation is that, you know, our, our federal funding usually is K through 12. So that's where that came from. But as we see more of an emphasis on early learning, I think we're legitimate in trying to, uh, to make sure that as we look at policies that, that reference K through 12 and we're updating them, let's update it with pre-K through 12. So we're right there with you. Okay, yeah, because I have seen the inconsistency. We'll say early learning, but it, I don't know if we have a, an overall definition for what that means. Sometimes it's P through three, sometimes it's not. So um, I'm just looking for consistency there, and thank you for letting me know about that. Um, those efforts by um, Kashel. Um, on further going down, uh, down more under the strategic plan goal, ninth grade on track credits. Um, one, two, three, third bullet, credit accumulation. Does this basically mean credit earning accumulation? Correct. throwing me off there. That okay. is, yes, you are exactly right. Okay, I was just trying to make sure I wasn't on the wrong idea there. Okay, um, and then going further down, um, that is stuff I'll email about. <laughs> um, under safe and welcoming, no, yeah, safe and welcoming schools, first of all, yeah, safe and welcoming, um, not welcome. Um, there is part about the promoting adolescent health. I'm wondering, is that is that going to be aligning with the new sex ed legislation um, or a mandate, whatever I'm, what you're calling it now? But is that work? Um, you you know, I I don't have an answer for that. Um, the the I I don't know if we have to, but I don't know. That's a good question. I will have to get back to you on that. Especially okay. since, that, especially since that was just on a ballot, so, yeah. Yes. Exactly, and I think if we could send any updates about that to the SSC and I committee, that can come at a later time. This is this is about the approval of the the plan. Any more yes. questions, Director yes. Um, I had some other things, but you know, I can. I know we're being crunched here. I um, just wanted, and I'm, I appreciate that this mentions uh, working with the. Um, well, it says. Um, reopening task force, but I'm, I'm assuming it means the remote learning task force. I think it just hasn't been, that yes. name was changed, those, those changes. So, um, but yeah, no, I appreciate that, that, that there's a connection in there for that, um, for all the work that you're going to be doing. Uh, no other questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank and you. Thank and you. final, Bye. yep. And thank you. Uh, final comment to director Rankin. Thanks. Um, I just, uh, quickly wanted to add sort of a, a, theme I'm hearing or or some things that I'm hearing from other directors that have reinforced uh, something that I've been thinking about is for um, just, I guess, to plant it in your mind, um, Dr. DeBacker and, uh, and Eric Anderson, for the 21-22, if we could have a conversation about um, the, I, I feel as though we have an opportunity to um, dig more into the research part, um, and, and be proactive in our use of this department to guide us forward, uh, as opposed to, um, sort of monitoring the present, if that makes sense. Um, and looking at the kind of, kind of related to what director, uh, Hersey, Hersey was mentioning about kind of the storytelling um, you know, how, how we can focus on um, creating a plan around not just reporting what's happening, but actually helping us in um, decision making, identifying issues that we want to solve, and then using um, research to help us uh, figure out a path forward. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, uh, Director Rankin. It does make sense, and and you know, it's. It, it, I think there is a way that we can we can uh, have a strike a really good balance here. Is that you'll see in this report that I mean, it is it's it we're really working internally to support the work of the district and our and our strat plan, but that work then has to be able to be transparent to the public. And in terms of, so you had this strap plan, you did this, now what? And what did we get for it? And I think that's what I'm hearing. Yeah, I think it's that second. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I would love to keep talking about it. Not right now, but just wanted to put that. Thank you. 
Thank you, Director Rankin. Uh, with that, I would love us to recess for 16 minutes for folks to take a brief pause, a brief break and stretch, and um, we will come back at 5.50 p.m.
12.50 p.m. The next item we'll move to is introduction item number two. This is the Seattle Public Schools SPS Personal Services Contracts PSC for Equal Opportunity Schools EOS. This came through the Student Supports, Stu Student Supports Curriculum and Instruction Policy Committee on November 10th for approval. I will now turn it over to our Chief of the Office of Af African American Male Achievement, Dr. Mia Williams, with a briefing before we move to the directors uh, with comments and questions. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, um, President DeWolf. Um, I'm um, Mia Williams, Chief of the Office of African American Male Achievement. And I'm so excited to be here today to introduce um, our partnership, our hopeful partnership with Equal Opportunity Schools. Um, we this this is another example of how our cross division work um, has come together to support um, our efforts of centering our black boys and teens and students for some which educational justice across the um, CNI. Um, curriculum instruction team, um, student supports is across all this work coming to the equity partnership and engagement team. All of these divisions have come across to get us to this day. So I'm super excited about that. Um, the bar is asking um, the board to authorize the contract with Equal Opportunity Schools um, for the purpose of providing services to the district to support, support the development of equitable access to participation in high school advance coursework of example of advanced placement and international baccalaureate. We issued an RFP um, and Equal Opportunity Schools was selected. As background, it is one of the leading organizations in the United States in helping schools and district help students of color and low income students to access advanced academic pathways. The bar refers to two main reasons why we need this support. This support. First, um, during an engagement time, we had the opportunity to, to engage with all of the high school principals. And um, this is something that they believe as um, that is an important um, need within each of the high schools. And um, Garfield has been in partnership with Equal Opportunity Schools for a while in the past, and it has been a positive experience. Also, I was able to, um, speak with some of um, leaders of some of our um, community-based organizations to give them a heads up about um, our potential partnership with Equal Opportunity Schools and um, planning future engagements of having like an evening with Equal Opportunity Schools so families can ask more questions. It was also recommended from one of um, our community-based partners to maybe have a video that um, could be directed for the audience of families and communities so that they could um, view it at, at a time that's appropriate for them and then send questions if they had so that we can make sure that our partnership, that we are meeting their needs and answering any questions that they may have. So we're looking forward to that opportunity. Also, um, on when we were doing the racial analysis, this is all about um, our racial equity work, promoting racial equity. Um, Equitable access to advanced academic pathways has been a persistent, well-documented challenge in Seattle Public Schools. Equal Opportunity Schools has increased 30% increase in the number of students of color and low-income students taking and passing college credit courses for year one and two um, across, across our nation. Um, we are trying to move one of our core goals for goal five KPIs, as you will um, see in the district scorecard last Thursday, we need help with advanced coursework learning. We're flat for students of color for this away from education justice. There's a drop in African American males for advanced learning in ELA. Improvements, but overall low in math. Um, I just wanted to also bring, um, as we were in committee, there were a couple of questions. I just want to remind some that were brought up. On November 10th, um, there were questions around the data sharing agreement with Equal Opportunity School, and um, what was shared in response to that is that um, by um, Director James Bush is that we've we've had a partnership in the past where we've had a data sharing agreement. We would use that as to update that, 
and um, uh, move. Uh, we will yes, we will use that as a as a way to share. And there was a question about um, the people looked in the data points about business project manager who was covering that. And that is something that comes from the Office of the Equal Opportunity Schools was the answer. And it says, as you see that we're asking um, to our potential partnership to continue for year two and three, and it was asked, would we be updating the board on, and I said, of course, we'll be updating the board on our success with our partnership. Um, and then how will this contract improve our practice and on a longer term? And um, we look forward to equal opportunity and what they bring to each individual high school and working with their equity teams there. Um, that builds capacity with the with the the staff. And we also talked about how counselors can be a part of the training. And then as that happens, the teacher leadership will be able to spread these practices across. Um, multiple places and our hope is is that what things can we learn for to benefit in middle school and elementary around these practices what i'm super excited about is that um, equal opportunity schools partners directly with students and with the staff and also informing and supporting families and this is something that we need to make sure um, that we are doing that it is it's it's a collective um, partnership and um, so I'm just thrilled and I'm open for any questions that you may have now. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams. Uh, we'll now move to directors for comments and questions, beginning with Director Rankin, who is our Student Services Instruction and Curriculum Committee Chair. Thank you. Um, yeah, Dr. Williams actually covered a lot of the discussion that we had um, in committee. Um, one of the questions that came in from me was about um, the, the longevity and how, not just related to this, but to other, uh, other contracts, you know, how can we um, benefit from contracts like this? in uh, improving our practice as a district, as opposed to um, always needing to bring in other other organizations. And so um, Dr. Williams just touched on that, but uh, I was really excited to hear about um, that piece of this, that it really is, you know, working with our staff and our buildings um, to improve our own capacity and practice um, to support uh, great opportunities for students. And um, it feels like a, in the short term, it will help us address some of these gaps that we know that we have. Um, and then hopefully in the long term, help us um, kind of course correct as a system. So hopefully um, the gaps that are being addressed in the short term are are diminished because we are improving our practice in response to this work. Um, so I will now um, pass it to the next director. Thank you, Director Hampson. Hi, thank you. Uh, and, and thanks for bringing this forward. Uh, I mean, I, I personally, I I believe we probably could have um, just let this be a matter of, of, of staff um, decision at this dollar level, but I appreciate very much the opportunity to um, get a better understanding of Equal Opportunity Schools, uh, what they do. And I think my only question at this point is about, um, I was trying to double check if there was any data around after school, what the impacts of, um, of their success in those AP and IB courses translating into not just going to college, but then, you know, their, their kind of relative, um, uh, well, I know there's, I'm, I'm trying, I'm seeing some of it, but like, does, how is it helping them once they're in college? Are they, is it more confidence, um, more success? Um, that, what, what is that? What do those outcomes look like? 
I great great question, and I will be happy to follow up with them, and I'm sure that they have it, um, as they have been working with many schools across the nation and even within our own state. And what's super exciting is that they their home base is in Seattle. Um, so I will definitely follow up with that and share that with um, with the team during the Friday memo, if that's okay. Yeah, that would be great. Um, and because one of the things I, I think about uh, in, in a, some place like Washington State where we're not just isolated you know, I mean, we're, we have students of color that are isolated geographically within kind of the larger Puget Sound. And then from the standpoint of their options for uh, academic institutions, it's a long way from home to go um, for, you know, to, to, to other than University of Washington. I mean, we're lucky that we've got some great institutions right here in Seattle, but um uh, call it. It's just otherwise you're you're talking about geographic distances that are that are pretty far, and so I always worry a little bit about that um, that we, we don't kind of as a state because we're sort of a rural state in general and in the rural Pacific Northwest that we don't offer um, a lot of a lot of options. And so I'd love to learn a little bit more about how they're track how they're tracking this longitudinally and and how that's that's impacting. But otherwise, sounds great. Really. Um, support the, the, I mean, obviously the need is there, uh, excited that, that y'all are getting to pursue this partnership and looking forward to supporting. And, and yeah, I'd love to hear more about what their, um, the longer term success is for those students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Director Harris. Thank you. I have a few questions and I'd appreciate the answers being attached to the action uh, report for the next go round. You've mentioned several times that this is a nationwide group and they've dealt with dozens and dozens of other districts. Can, can they put together which districts and what their results have been? I, I think that benchmarking is very important. Two, um, are we signing a contract for three years or are we reevaluating it after one year? In so um, that the question is, is that we are we are signing it for I'm hopeful to sign it for this year, but with hopes that that it's going to be phenomenal that we want to continue. So instead of having to keep bringing it forward every year, we wanted to make sure that we put that into the bar at this time. Um, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll be happy to give updates annually. Um, on how the partnership's going and the success of what's happening within Seattle Public Schools and our high schools yearly. Would you consider making a one-year contract subject to review of the data of success? Because being informed and having the option not to continue the contract is very, very different. Yes, from what I understand is that we will be signing. It's it's a yearly contract sign um, that we sign. Yes, but I believe that the message of bringing it in front of the board again um, as um, an opportunity to do that. But we do sign a yearly contract. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And what about the benchmarking from these nationwide schools? Um, yes. Yes, I can. Um, I can definitely ask, and I do know that they do have data to share about different districts, and I will work on um, gathering some of that, and I will share it with you all. Yes, I appreciate it immensely. Thanks so much. On to the next director. Thank, Thank you, you, Director Hurst. Uh, we've discussed this at length, so I don't have any additional questions. I'm excited for this to come through. I think it's going to be critical for our Kings and excited uh, for the work that's gone into this. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams. Thanks, Director Hersey. Uh, Director Mack. Yeah, uh, I too am incredibly excited about this approach and this partnership. Uh, Dr. Williams, thank you so much for bringing it forward. And also, you know, even if it's, well, the fact that it's kind of on the bridge of low dollar amount, uh, but it can have such a massively positive impact, I think is just phenomenal. So I'm, I'm super excited about the focus on ensuring access to accelerated coursework for students and the, and, um, uh, 
just really appreciate uh, focusing on this work. It's just so important. So thank you. I don't have any questions. Um, just happy to support it when it comes back. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Director of Hi, um, thank you. I, I, my, I've heard about this um, this for months, I think, with Min and from Dr. Williams, and I'm very excited, also very supportive. Um, I have, I guess, one other question I'd have is I know that in committee, you well, even now you mentioned, you know, this is, you put out an RFP for this. I'm wondering who were the other, um, did you receive any other responses, and what made Equal Opportunity School stand out over those? Um, great, great question. Um, there was well, actually there were they were in the final end they were the only organization and part of the reason was that many of the organizations do not do the comprehensive um, work that they do and have had the results part of some of the organizations were asking like could we do parts of what you're asking for and then partner with another company so their comfort um, comprehensive work that they do to support our our students and staff around um, creating access was surpassed um, any of the organizations that we looked at. We did look at other competitive people. There's really not a lot of organizations across the nation that is actually really focused in this work. And the results also would be number one that I would share that um, that also put them ahead. Um, but we did invite other groups to apply. Um, and like I said, we did look at other organizations and their questions came back is because they don't do the comprehensive work around creating the access that Equal Opportunity does. Awesome, thank you. And they're local, aren't they? I mean, they're national, but Equal Opportunity yes. School is based here in Seattle, correct? I might have mentioned yes. that already, but I think that's pretty awesome that we can support a local organization. So, all right, um, yeah, thank you for all the information. No further questions. Thank you. Um, and I have no further questions as well, Dr. Williams, but I thank you so much for your work on this. And I just want to say I do appreciate bringing this, even though it doesn't hit that threshold. I appreciate the transparency. And and I just want to just make sure that I give a huge shout out to Dr. Perkins and his team. Um, and like I said, this partnership across divisions is just huge. And I just am excited for us to continue to mimic that across our system. Um, so I just wanted to just give a shout out. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Okay, the next item is introduction item number three. This is annual approval of programs or schools using the alternative learning experience, ALE model, and review of policy number 2255, alternative learning experience, schools or programs. This came to the Student Supports Curriculum and Instruction Policy Committee on November 10th for approval. Dr. Dan DeBacker, I will turn it over to you for your brief before I turn it over to directors for questions and comments. Thank you, President DeWolf. Um, this board action report details the alternative learning experience programs at Cascade Parent Partnership Program, Interagency Academy School, Nova High School, and Middle College School. This is in accordance with board policy 2255 to meet state requirements. Each school or program that is using the alternative learning experience model must be approved by the board and must have their plan and annual report reviewed annually in order to receive the state funding. Our school boards must also review the district policy authorizing the alternative learning experiences so you found the policy within your packet. The regulation contains several requirements that the programs or schools must meet. Um, the annual reports for the four, four programs provide updates on how these programs are meeting these requirements and serving their students. As you can see, it was a fairly extensive package of about over 70 pages, so I hope you've had time to read that. Uh, for engagement, the principals continue to engage with their community regarding their programs and providing the alternative learning experience service described in their plans and their reports. For the racial equity analysis, you'll find that each ALA annual report intentionally assesses the efforts each school is making in addressing the racial disparities in educational outcomes. Um, there were a few points that were raised at the uh, student support and curriculum and instruction meeting. Uh, the directors asked the principals to share any additional support their schools could use 
because uh, all four principals were at that um, at that committee meeting. Uh, common themes were that more equitable funding funding for these small schools. They say they don't always receive the support that they need in terms of funding. You've heard that before. Um, there was an interest they're often referred to as hidden gems, and they'd like to be less invisible and less hidden in the school district. Uh, they did uh, emphasize district support for ethnic studies and district coordination for that program. Restorative practices are critical. And then for a middle college, securing more space. And we have been working on that um, to, to secure more space for them. Um, we will continue to look for ways to, to meet their, um, when they were asked a question, to, to meet what they, they've asked for um, in consent, continued conversation. Need to say that we have revised the charts on page four, but we missed one area. Um, all of the areas should have the same designations for the ethnicity and race. And in the Cascade Partnership, we added the Native, Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander, but we forgot to add the Native American um, category. So we will be making that change. Director Hampson, I apologize that we didn't catch that one even on the second round. Uh, with that, I'll take questions. Okay, we'll begin with Director Rankin as our SSC and I chair. Um. Thanks. Um, and thank you, Dr. DeBacker, for uh, the uh, review of the discussion. It, um, so this is, is an annual approval. It's an item that comes before the board every year. Um, but uh, we had, and I wish that we had had more time even in committee, because it was really, really nice to have a little bit of opportunity to talk with um, the four principals of these uh, unique schools. Um, and in addition to what uh, Dr. DeBacker mentioned, I will just add, um, that, uh, you know, we talked about support. Uh, Director Hersey um, was the one that asked, you know, what, what, what kind of support do you want from us? What questions or, or asks do you have um, for us as board directors? And um, in addition to the things Dr. DeBacker mentioned about space and funding, um, what stood out to me also was that a lot of the the things that we're talking about as as uh, developing district wider things that these schools are already doing really well. Um, they have uh, ethnic studies program or ethnic studies curriculums um, and approaches. They're doing restorative practice, um, uh, kind of scraping together with the resources that they do have. And so there's a, a great deal of mutual benefit to be had in continuing the conversation, not only to support these great programs, but also to to um, take a closer look at the things they are doing so well for their students and what makes them these gems and what makes students um, find their place there um, and, and see how we can learn from what they're doing to apply to some of the uh, the, the things that we know we want to invest in as a, as a whole system. Um, so it was really, really great to have the opportunity to have all four principals there. Um, I know we talked about wanting to continue some of that conversation. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Director Rankin. Okay, next up is Director Hampson. Uh, no questions right now. Thank you. Thank you. Director Harris. I am beyond a huge believer in alternative learning and using it as Director Rankin said, as a model to replicate. And, and if we go back a few years in the history of alternative education, many of the goals for alternative pathways were in fact as beta testers, if you will, for what works and what doesn't. And, and the idea was to 
expand those throughout the district. I, I don't know that we're doing that. I, I hope that we can, in fact, have those conversations and talk about pedagogy and talk about some of the things that work terrifically in these places that are not a quote-unquote comprehensive high school. Um, with respect to finding more space, I hope we can do that sooner rather than later. Our history of treatment of middle college is uh, painful and immoral. Um, I, I am excited to support this, and I, and I hope we can expand it, in fact. The other is, is in the weighted staffing standards or school modeling. Uh, some of these programs might, in fact, be considered more expensive. But again, I ask, where is the budget line item for saving lives and showing our students that they can in fact succeed and go on and do great things. Thank you. Director Hersey. Thank you. I think that um, Director Rankin pretty much summed up the, the gravity of the conversation that we have with our school leaders. Uh, I think that, again, I just want to reiterate, looking at these models as an opportunity for replication. Um, as an educator, alternative learning spaces are often looked at as, you know, places where students go when they don't assimilate well into our general population. And, and I really think that so many of these schools um, especially here in Seattle, really kind of take that narrative and flip it on their flip it on its head because of the the experience that they're providing for our students and, and really really instilling a place really instilling a sense of place and belonging um, that I think many of our schools could really take note of. So again, just excited to move this forward and continue the conversation with our school leaders. Director Mack. Uh, I, too, uh, sh uh, echo the comments of the former directors around support for alternative learning experience and, and, and having this, um, approving these schools and that. One of the, one of the things, and correct me, uh, Dr. DeBachter, if I'm incorrect here, but my understanding as well is that part of the model is that each student has an individual learning plan and they actually have to... Uh, you know, that has to be drafted and it's a part of the thing. So Cascade Parent Partnership, all of these schools, each student has an individual learning plan to support them along their way. And it is, um, you know, incredibly appropriate and supportive for those students. And, and, and I'm not wrong in that, right? Director? Nope, you you are correct. It's one, of, it's one of the foundational pieces of the ALE program. Right. Right, and I um, am a graduate of Fairhaven College uh, from Western Washington University, which is a, a it's, it's similar kind of approach. And I, I believe very strongly in um, having these opportunities available for students and uh, agree that um, expanding them and ensuring that each of the budgets for these schools are robust and supported to the degree that's necessary to provide the support to the students. So, um, happy to have this in front of us again and again encourage additional support for replicating and expanding um, these programs expanding access to students um, to know that they have they can they can access these programs when the comprehensive um, environment isn't the right um, fit thank you director rivera smith Thank you. Um, I agree with my colleagues regarding the um, committee meeting we had with the principals from the, the schools. It was so um, amazing to hear their stories and to hear their needs and appreciate that they were there. We definitely could have used more time um, to hear from them and speak with them. Um, I, I think um, most of what was said there has already been covered. Definitely they let us know about their needs. Um, definitely there was a need for some space, especially, I guess, for middle sorry yeah middle college because their space is gifted and um i'm sorry were you going to say something no I I say, sorry yes it was middle college okay. yeah thank you um and so you know we definitely need to look at these because it's about sustainability for these schools they they always kind of feel like they're on the 
possibly on the chopping block as, as, as far as funding goes or as far as just supports because they are sort of, they are lesser known, um, how we can highlight them more and give them the exposure they deserve, um, I think could do us all some good. I'm happy to um, approve this, this bar and thank you for, um, thank you, um, Dr. DeBecker for, um, for all the information for um, bringing in the principals uh, for that meeting. No further questions. Thank you. Uh, and I have no questions for you at this time. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Diane DeBeck. President DeWolf, may I say two things related to this um, in terms of replication? I want you to know that of these four schools, two of these schools are leading the ways in a couple efforts here in Seattle Public Schools and as a result of resolutions that this board has passed. Uh, Nova High School, uh, under the direction of Principal Winnett and students, they are helping to write the LGBTQ, LGBTQIA curriculum. They are, they are helping to lead this effort. And um, an internet interagency, just this morning, I was at the site visit for their outdoor education pilot that they have proposed for their welding program. So we, we, they are leading and, and they are being, I think we'll see replication. And so it's just amazing out of 104 schools in Seattle Public Schools, two of these four are doing amazing things right now. And the other two are as well, but I wanted to mention that. Thank you, Dr. DeBecker. I really appreciate the context and the background. Okay, we'll now move to introduction item number four. This is approve hotspots for students to support remote learning through the school year 2020 through 2021. This came through SSC and I uh, policy committee on November 10th for approval. Uh, so Chief Financial Officer Joe Lynn Berge, you will be briefing us today and then we'll move to directors for comments and questions. I will, good evening. Uh, this uh, bar are hotspots, particularly from Verizon and Mobile Beacon that will exceed $250,000 for school year 2021 and are therefore required to be presented in a bar for board approval. Amounts are noted in the motion there is information on page two regarding uh, 1920 costs and vendors, and that's included for transparency and background. Uh, finally, I don't recall any questions um, at committee. That concludes my remarks. Thank you. Okay, we'll begin with Director Rankin. Thank you. Um, my main comment at committee was hey, it is super great that SPS is able to do this and make sure students have access. And also, hey, this is sort of a basic need in 2020 uh, for families. And um, it is uh, worth noting that um, without a school district stepping up to provide something that really should be a basic utility, um, these students will not have access to public education. That's it. Thank you, Director Rinkin. <clears throat> uh, Director Hampson. Apologies, uh, looking for my mute button. Uh, I don't think I have any. Um, I don't think I have any detailed questions. Um, I think that uh, what we need to know about this will. Uh, I believe we'll will be forthcoming with the remote learning task force and um, something that we're, we'll, we'll need to look at over time. But there are a lot of different legislative wheels in motion um, that may or may not have a positive impact on, on our ongoing need to to provide this. But I'm, I'm glad that we're able to. Uh, that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Director Harris. I am in favor of many hot spots as we can get into student and family hands as possible. And I would also uh, mention that the Seattle City Council is addressing their budget and everybody listening should write the council, not just their own council members, and suggest that we move into the year 2020 and make internet access a utility like other cities have done. Thank you. Thank you, Director Harris. Here, here, I concur. Next, we'll move to Director Hersey. Yeah, I just want to second uh, municipal broadband. As much as I'm excited to move this forward, uh, we, we need a better solution long-term. Thank you. 
Thank you. All right, Director Mack. Yes, thank you. Um, I want to echo the uh, advocacy uh, statements that my colleagues are making around broadband and uh, this is access and that the fact that this falls on the district to cover is fundamentally inequitable and WASDA has um, uh, supported and drafted and accepted a number of position statements around this. Um, and if it's not on our legislative agenda, and I, I, I apologize, I took a, took, a, took a quick gander at the draft, but I um, didn't, uh, uh, I'm not remembering whether or not it's on there, but I do feel as if it, it's, it's incredibly important that that be part of our legislative agenda um, uh, at this point in time. And, and, and uh, Chief Berge, can you speak to that, whether or not, um, that's on our legislative agenda. Yeah, yes, it is. It's under the access portion. So we talked about access to technology. Okay, excellent. And uh, appreciate that. And um, yeah, support. Uh, I guess actually one quick question. I'm sorry for just for clarification. The dollars are coming from which fund to cover this? So the dollars are coming from um, BTA4, and there's a small bit of the Comcast donation that's left over from 1920 of $2,700. So um, as I stated in committee, I'll do my best to try to find some more donations, but right now we've gone through all of our donations and, and we're into our own budget. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank for, thanks for the clarification. And thank you to the voters for supporting us in our efforts. Thank you. Director Rivera Smith. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, I th thanks, uh, Jolene, for the follow up information here. I, there was, I think there was a few questions to committee. I remember I asked um, regarding the hotspots uh, if this was to be purchased or have been. You mentioned that most of the hotspots have actually already been purchased. This is mostly for the service for those. Um, at the time, you said there was 750 left. Um, out of 5,116, have those 750 been distributed or are we still working on that? Still working on that. I think we're, I think we're at about 500 left to distribute. Awesome. Well, getting those out is awesome. And I, I have no other questions. Thank you. Thank you. And I, thank you, uh, Chief Berge. I don't have any questions for you at this time. Thank you. Okay, next item is introduction item number five. This is approval of community schools and outdoor education task force. This came through the student supports curriculum and instruction policy committee on November 10th for approval. This item is being sponsored by directors Rankin, Hampson and Hersey. So directors, I will hand it over to you to introduce this item. I'm not sure who wants to uh, kick things off. Uh, I'll just turn it to director Rankin as the chair of the committee and then uh, you can uh, facilitate for me. Thank you. Um, sorry, a little uh, eight-year-old eight interruption. Um, yeah, that we brought this through um, committee, which is kind of funny because um, you know any questions and two two of us had helped write it. So um, we are really excited to bring forward this item. Um, this item is um, part of what was outlined in our uh, reopening resolution that uh, wanted to make opportunity to students in um, place-based community and outdoor learning um, in two pieces. One was the um, was to initiate an, an immediate process for opt-in pilots, um, which. I uh, have been really exciting to see start to come to fruition. Um, and then the second part, which is the approval of the task force, is to establish a task force for um, longer term, longer term impacts and a district wide opportunity. So this would form a task force made up of community members, um, educators, outdoor education professionals, community organizations um, uh, to come together to make recommendations for 
outdoor and community school opportunities across all of SPS. And um, the eventual, ho hopeful eventual uh, adoption of recommendations that come from this task force would then shift from being, um, you know, opt-in here and there to being a, a fully comprehensive uh, program um, that we would want to see every student in Seattle Public Schools have opportunity to participate in. And um, what's so exciting to us about this work is that um, in the immediate health situation, students are in remote learning, students are feeling isolated from their peers, they're feeling disconnected from their communities, um, and being together outdoors is significantly less risky than being together indoors. And so um, recommendations that come out of here will support um, in-person opportunities should the, you know, should the pandemic have us in a remote or partially remote situation for longer than this school year. But additionally, it will create um, a structure to give uh, a really power to our school communities and um, uh, opportunity to students to experience education based upon where they are. And whether that means culturally, geographically, physically, um, we really want to support um, flexibility and thinking around education beyond the four walls of our school buildings. And we happen to live in a, you know, rich urban area that's nestled in one of the most beautiful natural um, spaces uh, anywhere. And um, what better opportunity for our students than to learn about themselves um, in the very immediate context of of where they live um, and who the people are around them. And so I'm really excited about this. And if uh, directors Hampson or Hersey have anything to add, um, please, please go ahead. So I, I can move through and just start with Director Hampson. Um, I, I don't have a whole bunch more to add. I, I think uh, one of the the uh, I think benefits of this um, will 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 be as yet to be seen. I, I, this was an opportunity to uh, take a really horrible situation um, of, of of shutdown and and look at the best possible um, uh, reimagination of education and um, to me place-based learning is that and it is the original form of education um, and it is the uh, true form of family engagement and community engagement when we do place-based learning um, because it is about connecting to our families and um, their cultures and the and then also the places geographically whether they're um, indigenous to somewhere else or indigenous to this place that um, those things need to be part of the educational process. And we're all well aware of when that does not happen, what the ultimate impact is on our um, ability to exist and sustain ourselves uh, in the, on this planet and in our, um, within our health, health and well-being. And um, so I'm, I'm uh, excited about the learning that this will bring to to the district, um, the, the potential that it has to bring it back to what is um, an area that is incredibly rich in place-based knowledge and understanding about um, how to exist with one another and um, in, in the places that we are. And in, in a conversation um, earlier today around the uh, potential for, or, or the uh, a resolution that directors Rivera-Smith and, and uh, uh, Director DeWolf were working on with uh, community members. Uh, we had a rich conversation about the notion of how um, even the structure, the, the buildings, how we look 20 years into the future um, and what our buildings should look like really should be connected to how the students are learning in those in those spaces. And so um, I really do believe that it's 
forcing us to think in a new way and which is the very definition of what we're having to do right now in the middle of this pandemic and um, taking the best possible notion of that. Um, so I think that's all I have to um, say. I think Director Hersey, if you want to add anything more, I guess I, I, I would just say, um, you know, equity is everything in this model. And um, because it is in fact a return to uh, indigenous knowledge that, that makes this successful. And that is very much about connecting with the needs of our students for this from educational justice and their families um, and in terms of how we, we kind of rebuild the education process. So that's, that is inherent in this. And now I'll turn it over to Director Hersey if he wants to add anything. Yeah, yeah, so the only thing that I would add is that um, I'm really excited about this because uh, looking forward, really thinking about how does this model ultimately incorporate itself into what we're already offering. Um, I think that for many of our students, especially those of color, when we think about our buildings, um, sometimes we just need to offer something completely different because if we really are truly trying to be an anti-racist organization, the buildings in which we go to school are, are built and developed um, with so much trauma and racism and, and negative history built into the bricks of these schools that, that oftentimes we need to figure out what is a way that we can circumvent all of that and provide something bold and different. Um, like I said, there's there's really nothing else that I can add to this that Director Hampson and Director Rankin haven't already addressed, but I am excited to see this finally come before us and I, and I hope that we move this forward expeditiously. Blah, expeditiously. Thank you, Director Hersey. All right, we'll go to Director Harris next. I am extraordinarily supportive of looking at new models because we all know that the old models don't work. I'm interested in details about community schools and how the governance and oversight of that will work. And I'm sure that the task force will wrestle significantly with that. Um, I'm also interested in the reporting out aspect of this task force. And, and how that's going to happen, whether we'll get interim reports, whether minutes will be updated to the website, et cetera. But yay team, and thank you all for putting this together. And uh, I think it's very exciting, but again, the devil's in the details. Thank you. Thank you, Director Mack. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, I too am very excited about uh, this effort and in last night's work session, um, there was a budget line item called community schools that was brought up for conversation. And I think the number was $16.7 million that has been sitting in a fund dedicated to community schools. Um, and I know, and unfortunately I haven't been around long enough and there's other people that might be able to help fill in on the history of this, but the community schools effort some 20 years ago, um, I'd like to ensure that, you know, potentially, if, I mean, frankly, if those dollars have been set aside for community schools, then that may be something that needs to be made aware of this task force in terms of moving this work forward. Because even I, I fully support this effort and I, I fully support uh, refocusing on community schools and this district has in its history done that at uh, various points in history. Um, and so I, I, I would like to, um, I guess, get more information from staff on what that previous community schools effort entailed and um, how those dollars that are presently sitting in a fund uh, relate to um, this present work and whether or not it actually makes the most sense to kind of dedicate um, that those funds to this work that the task force is going to be doing um, on our buildings. Um, so I just want to raise that in the consciousness of uh, of the work and I, I and I certainly support um, this um, 
effort going forward and the focus that um, it's bringing. And I guess right. I don't I don't know if anyone oh. has the ability to provide that history at this point, or is that something that we can? I this is I, Director I, Rankin. I can clarify a tiny bit. Um, I think uh, community schools and outdoor education may be a bit of a misnomer. And now I I'm, I apologize. I can't remember because I know Miss Wilson Jones asked <laughs> about this because we had uh, a slight wording difference between the the charter and that's this with this and the um, bar and uh, it's really community community based um, community schools as it exists now in Seattle public schools to my understanding and I'm sure somebody who's with more longevity can explain um, has to do with wraparound services I believe so it may just be that we need to make sure that the wording is distinct that we're not accidentally referencing something that already exists. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. I Yes, I do. And I do, I, I do appreciate it, but I think actually kind of taking a dive into that language because community schools in the current context in our history has a certain meaning, which I actually, I, I need to, you know, fully understand. I think it would be helpful for us all to fully understand that context and that, that movement that was happening some time ago. Um, and I would, I would ask that um, there be, you know, clarity in the naming and language so we, we don't confuse if they're not tied together. So I appreciate you thinking on that so, and, and appreciate you saying that. Thank yeah, you. thank you. I No, thank you so much for bringing that up. And I will, I will um, work with Dr. DeBacker and um, we'll try to get that sorted before action. Okay, we'll finish up with Director Rivera-Smith. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, as the only uh, member of the uh, committee that was not an author, <laughs> I had um, all the time I needed to ask questions, and I did. I got some um, clarification. Actually, we got the board member in the bar, so it is specific that a board member will be on this task force. Um, um, I asked about... Um, I asked about the filling in of the dates, which I see are still not filled in. So I'm just wondering if we will have those filled in by action. That's in the, the dates aren't in the charter because the task force themselves will um, finalize the dates. Okay, so this the will charter. be- The that. charter doesn't have to be, the charter is really here as reference. Gotcha, um, okay. We're not approving the charter as part of the bar. We're not approving the charter as part of the bar. Is that correct? I mean, I thought that that's correct. What the charter, the charter itself is a draft, and it's here for reference because, um, okay, as with other task forces, um, the charter can be, be developed on a different timeline, and the task force themselves may uh, want to make amendments. Gotcha. Okay, so we're just approving the creation of this task force, essentially. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I'm super excited to get this going because I know I've had lots of uh, questions from community asking when when we're going to have this, so that they could try to to um, get on get on board with that and see some pilot start. So definitely, um, really excited about this. Um, I think I will just also ask, just because I feel like I I can see how it can seem maybe unnecessary, but I'm wondering, should a racial equity analysis been like the actual you know, form been completed for this. It doesn't look like there's, there's not one attached and it doesn't sound like one was done for it. And again, I, I can see like just by the nature of this, it sounds like, well, this is a given <laughs> that it's um, uh, in the scope of, you know, creating racial equity. But I, I and maybe I'm using this as an example. We have, you know, even the previous bar didn't have one, you know, for the hot spots, And we have some upcoming ones that don't. And, but then some, you know, like, I, I'm just wondering, when do we do the forms and not do the forms? And should one have been completed here? Okay, well, let's focus on the task force for the question, but it's a great mm -hmm. question. We can outline. Director Rankin, do you have a okay. response? I'm trying to remember. I, Director Hansen? We Hansen? actually did complete the, yeah, we did go through the, um, the, okay. it's not, a, it's, it's less of a form and more of a process, right? So if you've mm -hmm. gone through it, so we did do that. And then I think one of the questions we have outstanding 
in general about the board action report, which we need to deal with at a separate time, is when we attach it and when we when we um, summarize in the in the board action report, um, and and because that we it, it it's not always applicable in the same way. In fact, many times it's it's we almost need like two or three different versions of it because of the nature of the thing. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's something that, that, yeah, we need to refine it. Um, but it's not something that I think anybody <laughs> wants to tackle right now. Um, but the, the questions themselves are still, you know, relevant and I, and I can, um, forward, um, the, um, quote unquote form with the, with the notes to the, to the board for, before, for action. Okay, you. could you attach it here, or is it less formal than that? Uh, I mean, I think so. I, I don't know. I, it, 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 one of the things, too, Rick, is, is that it's an additional Rick, thing to get. I'm, I'm going to let you two work out how to, how to um, <laughs> yep, that's inform fine. the board of the analysis, whether you want to attach it or send it um, offline. But I um, want to make sure we're moving to our agenda here, because we still do have a number of items to go. So any other questions, yep, Director Bersley? Um, no, I do not. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Okay, we'll move to introduction item number six. This is selection of benefits administration and consulting services firm Sprague Israel Giles Inc. This came to the Audit and Finance Committee on November 9th for approval. Dr. Codd, I believe you will be briefing us before I turn it over to directors for questions and comments. Yes, thank you. Hello again. This is Clover Cod, Chief Human Resource Officer. Uh, this bar, should you authorize us, allows us to enter into a three-year contract with Sprague Israel Giles, our third-party benefits administrator. It would be for the next three calendar years. Uh, 2021 would be for 650,000. Calendar year 2022 would be for 682,500. And calendar year 2023, would be for $716,625,000. We did conduct an RFP. Um, we received only two proposals. One was from Coastal Administrative Services, uh, and they quoted us amount to $10 per employee. And the other was from SIG, which is roughly $7.04 per employee, but a flat rate uh, to start off with was $650,000. We did. We were asked in audit and finance around market rates, and what we have found is that it market rate is between seven dollars and eight dollars and fifty cents per hour, or excuse me, per employee. So you can see that uh, SIG is on the lower end. Um, so benefits administration includes everything that we typically think of with the uh, with SEB or the. Um, school Employees Benefit Board. So it's our medical, our dental, our vision, our basic life, our accidental death, long-term disability coverage. And so uh, SIG actually is the administrator for these services. I'm going to stop there and see if there are any additional questions. All right. Thank you, Dr. Codd. I will start with our Audit and Finance Committee Chairperson, Director Hampson, to kick us off. Thank you. Uh, we had a good discussion about this, and uh, it's you know it, it's a it's a great example of um, things that that school boards have to consider in terms of contracting for outside vendors. Uh, do you go outside of the organization? Um, is it is it um, more efficient to to go outside versus trying to bring it in house? Do you have the uh, expertise in house? Do you want to keep the expertise in house? Um, it's a it's a pretty big job. We have a good relationship with this particular entity, and then we um, we did, and then a massive change, a big shift, right, with Seb. And so uh, we, we had a good, robust discussion about that and about the you know the difference in pricing. And thank you, uh, Chief Cod, for coming back with that additional information. Um, it, my personal sense of it. Um, uh, as a as a board member, is that um, this is a this is a pretty good deal that we're getting, uh, and uh, a relationship that that we want to maintain. If we were to go to a new provider, um, the pricing is definitely going to uh, to increase. And um, I think for as long as we're we are able to confirm that we're getting good service, it makes sense. And we had some other discussions about the flat rate, um, and 
uh, but by and large, I think um, I, I feel quite comfortable with this, and, but I'm sure folks will have questions. So I will uh, turn it over to the next director to ask questions. All righty, we'll move to Director Harris. Uh, we'll echo Director Hansen's comments. We did have a very lengthy discussion on this an ANF as to whether or not we're just rolling over old contracts and and I don't believe that we are in fact doing that. I think we looked at it with a jaundiced eye and we're getting a good deal. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next is Director Hersey. Yeah, so I'm fine on this particular item, but I do have a question about our RFP process. It, it seems like when we put out these RFPs, that it's not very common for us to get more than one or two responses. I'm just interested in the process. Like, are, is there just not a whole lot of folks that are doing the type of work that we are uh, asking, or is it because the RFP that we're writing isn't as um, attractive to to other firms? Uh, I and that might be kind of like a question that can get answered offline. But I'm starting to see a pattern over uh, over many you know, various contracts that we're only getting one or two responses or bids for a lot of the work that we're putting out. Chief Cod, do you, did you want to take sure. that? I have a couple of things that I can say, but I'm happy to let you go first. If I can only speak with respect to this specific RFP. There, there just really are not a lot of people doing this work on behalf of school districts. It's, it's a really big job. Yeah, I, and I would just say my experience with uh, government is 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 that um, bids, you know, uh, responses to RFPs tend to come in a couple of different flavors, and either they're they're few and far between that have have actually um, are willing to focus on this area and are solid providers or on the particular area, right, the particular service that's being outsourced, um, and then uh, kind of the bottom feeder variety, which we get a lot of in our inboxes, right, um, as board directors, people trying to solicit um, contracts with us. And so um, it's from from my um, experience working in, in government, it's not unusual to have um, limited, but if others have experiences they want to share, I'm, I'm sure they will. Thank, thank you. Let's, let's make sure to focus this on this item. Um, so next up is Director Mack. Yeah, hi. Um, I my memory might be faulty, but I feel like last year when this came before us, it was uh, uh, Chief Berge who presented, and um, uh, my questions are kind of around the overall impact of Seb and the fact that we're maintaining this contract because in the shift to Seb. Um, the state is a not actually fully covering the costs of SEB, and that's happening across the state. We're not unique in that. But additionally, they are not providing the necessary uh, supports to employees to select the right packages and do the various work. And that that is what this contract is: is that in order to actually provide our employees with the appropriate level of service for benefits, we need to maintain this contract with Sprague Israel because there, there aren't very many folks that do it. They're, they're experts in that. But the gap is being filled because the state shifted to a state employee benefits program that doesn't actually provide the, the appropriate um, employee interface and support that we need in a district of 54,000 students with, um, I'm not throwing out the right numbers, but the number of employees that we've got. Um, and, and Chief uh, um, Cod, if you wanna to speak to that or if Chief Berge's on the line, I'm curious about the, you know, th this is another one of those massive funding gaps and something I think we need to continue on our legislative agenda uh, around the actual impact of the shift to SEB and the real financial impact to our bottom line. And, and if you could keep this response quick so we, we can focus on the item, please, Chief Cod. It's actually... Well, the, the, the question Chief. is, yeah, 
Thank you, Chief Berge. Thank you. Yep. So it is um, still a concern for us. We did have to expand the contract a little bit. Just the way that we're funding the contract had to change with SEB, and it was a, just a complete model shift to SEB, and it's a flat-out increase in cost for us of the contract, of this contract. Before, there was a way that you know most of this cost was paid by um, a, a different mechanism. So it is increased cost for SEB. We did not have it specifically on the ledge agenda this year because there were other things, but it's not forgotten. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Rankin. Um, I don't have any questions right now. Thanks. Thank you, Director Rivera-Smith. Well, no questions for me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cotta. I have no further questions for you at this time. Okay, next we'll move to introduction item number seven. This is the Seattle Teacher Residency Program contract. This came to the Audit and Finance Committee on November 9th for approval. Dr. Codd, I know you'll be briefing us again before we move to uh, directors for com comments and questions. Yes, thank you very much. So this is uh, Clover Codd again. So we are excited once again uh, to be able to partner uh, with the Seattle Education Association, the Alliance for Education, and the University of Washington to continue our efforts that really do support having a culturally responsive teacher in every classroom. This is for the Seattle Teacher Residency Program. We have um, over 100 grads in our schools to date. If you remember, graduates commit to five years of service of our, in our Title I schools. Over 50% of the graduates from STR are people of color. We have an 82% five-year retention rate for our STR grads compared to 61% retention rate for other teachers. Um, we did change uh, due to committee requests the level of community engagement on this bar to no longer be collaborate but instead be consult and involve and we chose consult and involve as opposed to inform because we still work very closely teacher induction program here in seattle public schools or our par program works very closely with both sea and the seattle education association to support these teachers into their first year and we also use it to think about how we might better align what the residents are learning with what's going on in Seattle Public Schools. So most people are used to the Seattle Teacher Residency Program, so I'm not gonna go on and on, but I will answer questions, of course, if you have them. Thank you. All right, we'll begin with Director Hampson as our Audit and Finance Committee Chair. Thank you. Uh, I. Uh, don't have anything to add. Thank you for, for addressing that um, uh, to the, the extent that you did. I, at some point, we need to clarify what exactly we mean um, by some of those terms. And, and so that's more work on us to do. Um, but I appreciate that additional clarity in terms of, of what we mean by consulting and, and collaborating. Um, and it's, a, I mean, just one of the programs we really need to celebrate. And I'm grateful to everybody who was um, contributed to making this happen and um, keeping it going. And um, thank you, and I'll turn it over to the next director. All right, Director Harris. Um, this is a bit of an expensive program, but I think it falls under the pay now or pay later, an investment concept. And, uh, and I think that we've seen extraordinary results and I'm a huge fan and also, a shout out to our partners in Clover. Could you name them all, please? Thank you. Yes, our partners are the Alliance for Education, the Seattle Education Association, and the University of Washington, and of course, ourselves, Seattle Public Schools. It's a four partnership um, endeavor. Okay, thank you. Director Hersey. Uh, yeah, there, I don't have any questions on this. I'm excited to move this forward. Thank you. Thank you, Director Mack. Uh, yeah, no questions. I uh, fully support this as I have in the past. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rankin. I don't have any questions. Happy to see this um, continuing on. Thank you, Director Rivera-Smith. Yep, 
same here. Um, definitely very grateful for the um, support from the Alliance and the city, and I uh, look forward to uh, bringing this at the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. And I will just echo that. i um, super excited and so grateful for this partnership. Thank you for the work on this, Dr. Cobb. Next, we will move to introduction item number eight. This is approval of the Washington State Auditors SAO Annual Audit, Audit Services Contract for the audit of the 2019 through 2020 fiscal year. This came to the Audit and Finance Committee on November 9th for approval. So Chief Berge, I believe you'll be briefing us again before we move to questions and comments from directors. Yes, thank you. So this is an annual bar that comes before the board. We are required by law to be audited annually. We're required by law to be audited by, audited by the Washington State Auditor's Office. So as Director Harris pointed out in the committee, this is a compliance item. And then I will pause for comments and questions. Thank you. We'll begin with Director Hansen. Uh, yeah, in terms of uh, our discussion in committee, um, it was a good one. Uh, we talked about that as being compliance. We could pay somebody else to do it, um, but that would be our, our dime, if I remember that correctly. And um, uh, if you haven't realized by now, I'm a, a, I am ai like audits, and uh, <laughs> and I'm glad that this is a compliance issue. So, um, uh, you know, go audit team. <laughs> Thank you, Director Hampson. All right, next is Director Harris. It's all been said. It's a compliance issue. We have to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Director Hersey. None for me, thank you. Director Rankin, excuse me, Director Mack. Yeah, no questions, thank you. Thank you, Director Rankin. I don't have any questions, but I just have to make fun of Director Hampson for saying I love audits. <laughs> That's the kind of nerds we want on the board. And thank I'm so glad that she does. Director Rivetta Smith. I have no questions. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't have any questions at this time. Thank you, Chief Berge, and thank you, Director Hampson. Next up is introduction item number nine. This is amending board policy number 6010 school funding model. This came to the Audit and Finance Committee on November 9th for consideration. So, Chief Berge, I believe you'll be briefing us again before we move to directors' comments and questions. Yes, thank you. So board members on the committee asked that we revise this policy to require superintendent procedures, which have been drafted and I believe are attached. Uh, that would conclude my remarks. Okay, we'll start with our ANF chairperson, Director Hampson. Thank you. Uh, I know there's going to be a lot of discussion about this. I, I want to uh, state that this particular policy is uh, a, a uh, top priority for me. Uh, it is one that I believe we need to take a lot of time and multiple steps uh, to uh, work through. And uh, as chair of and finance and working with Chief Berge, uh, we agreed that this would be a good step one because we did not have a procedure and there's an important interplay between policy and procedure. And so, um, uh, I, I wanted this to be step one, get the, the policy changed and, and um, in, in uh, satisfying the desire of directors that have stated previously to have the policy, the procedure come with it, with that change. Um, that has been presented now, and I believe that sets the stage for us to then do sub substantive work um, over how we as a board look at, at making changes to this policy over the next year. I think for me, it's a top priority for next year. Um, and that's why I wanna do it in, in this um, particular um, kind of order and time frame. Um, we're working on the participatory budgeting right now, which um, is another big step. And uh, I don't wanna you know, kind of completely overwhelm staff. I do believe that we need to do some deeper work in terms of what do we as a board, where do we stand as a board on, on our school funding policy? School funding, um, uh, model policy. Uh, we, I don't believe that we've done that work yet. So um, with that, um, I'm happy and grateful to bring this forward so that we can begin that work. And then I know other directors will have um, more to say. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Director Harris. Um, I, I find this 
particular policy problematic. I am grateful for the superintendent procedures. I will be bringing, and I believe I have some support on this board, an amendment to add a board member to this committee. And I would like very much to see uh, the term weighted staffing standards added to this before um, action. I think that having a board member on committees helps us collaborate better, helps us communicate better. I appreciate that there is a difference of opinion with Chief Berge, I'm still willing to talk about it. Um, but anytime we can get folks into the discussion, boots on the ground, I hear a great deal from principals about their frustration, trying to stretch the dollar further, what some principals believe are arbitrary and capricious cutoffs, for instance, X number for an assistant principal, uh, and lack of, lack of transparency of how this committee does its work. I don't doubt for a second that it's extraordinarily hard work I don't doubt for a second that uh, it needs to be done, but it's the how that it's been done and is done and the transparency that is very important. Um, I think folks may remember a couple of years ago, the librarians came to us and there was no librarian or substitute on that particular year's weighted staffing standard work group committee, whatever you want to call it. and and the answer was, well, SBA didn't put them on there. Um, we, we as a board have more input than what we're using. And I'm not talking about getting out of our lanes. I'm talking about understanding it a whole lot better than we do. And adding a board member to that committee, I think is a good thing. Thank you. Director Hersey. Uh, I have no questions on this at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Director Mack. Uh, yes, thank you. I um, appreciate that the procedures have been drafted here um, and and that the one word change in the policy is to require that and that we have them now. However, I feel as if kind of getting back to the um, uh, comments that Director Harris is making around the importance of the work group or committee. It's it's stated in the procedures as a work group, but it's not uh, stated in the policy that there will be a work group. And I think that from a policy standpoint, we as a board need to be clear about stating the process of expectation. Um, and that's not stated in the current policy, that it is a work group or committee or whatever the term needs to be that each year will deliberate um, the details of whether or not um, that work group and all of the, you know, who sits on it and, and all of that. I think that it does deserve more conversation. Um, I'm not sure whether or not it belongs in the policy um, mm. or not, but I do know that actually stating the requirement of a work group belongs in the policy, uh, just as requiring <laughs> procedures. Um, so I would encourage that uh, if there's opportunity, I appreciate the efforts to move it forward by getting the procedure written and having it drafted. Um, and that's been done, so I appreciate that. However, and the superintendent procedures can be put into place now. There's no requirement. I mean, they've drafted them, so they could just do that, and we don't actually need to make a policy change, and I'm happy to see the yeah. procedures finally written. However, if we're opening up the policy for amendments, having the directive that there is a work group engaged in this, um, I think is an, a really important thing from a policy standpoint that we need to state. Um, there may be some other, you know, minor things about, as you're saying, like really getting into, um, you know, the numbers that are listed here 
of what the priorities are and the guiding principles are that that language might benefit from some um, shifts and change. Um, and I haven't put enough brain space on this as to whether or not I have any specific ideas, but I, I would encourage that if we're going to go ahead and approve this with the requirement that there be procedures, I would also like to see that we require that the work group um, exist and be a transparent body. Thank you. Thank you. Director Rankin. Sorry, I was <laughs> looking at the looking at the document and then couldn't find my way back to um, to the window. I um, uh, we keep talking about policy versus procedure versus policy versus procedure, <laughs> um, uh, and. You know, to my mind, <laughs> you know what? No, I actually, well, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, no, I think I'm okay actually right now without any questions. Thank you. Director Rivetta Smith. Hi, thank you. Um, I appreciate the comments from my colleagues, and I, I'm, I'm also of the mind that I, I believe, when possible, procedure um, is beneficial to come with policy. Um, and so I, I agree with the, the initial change of this. The idea of changing um, the one or two words is going to be, um, as Director Harris mentioned, um, there was discussion in committee regarding um, representatives from our board taking part in the work group which I, I also do feel like Director Max said should probably be codified that the work group is um, expected. And so um, we're having that conversation still, but I, I, I believe in transparency and having uh, the ability to um, just, again, be transparent with our processes. So, um, but I know we're short on time, so I will not go too much more into it. Um, I will pass on now. Thank you. Thank you. And I have no questions for you at this time. Thank you for bringing this forward. I was really excited to see that the procedure has already been drafted. So next we'll move to introduction item number 10. This is approval of management and operations agreement from Memorial Stadium parking lot into the operations committee on November 5th for approval. So Chief Operations Officer Fred Podesta, I believe you'll be briefing us before we move to questions and comments. Yes, uh, thank you, President DeWolf. Um, this action uh, authorizes us to enter into an operating agreement um, for the Memorial Stadium parking lot. Uh, I think directors are aware the district owns a commercial parking lot adjacent to Memorial Stadium. For about, uh, I believe it has 268 spaces. And the district's practice has been, as are most commercial property owners, to engage an operating firm to operate the lot on our behalf. Those operations consist of managing the financial transactions and the equipment used, the automated equipment usually used to pay for parking um, and, and collecting those funds and paying credit card fees and managing that equipment. Um, some minor maintenance of the lot itself, restriping it and other things as necessary, um, um, uh, taking care of uh, uh, cleanliness at the lot and then providing um, on-site attendance for uh, major events in the times when such things are done as they're not um, uh, during the current pandemic. Um, as is the common practice in this arena, um, the operators are paid as a percentage of the gross revenue of the lot. Um, and um, this the contract, our current five-year contract comes to term at the end of um, 2020, and we put the um, operations out to bid and um, have selected um, our current operator, Republic Parking, to continue to operate the lot with going into a three-year contract with two optional renewal, um, annual options for extensions. And 
happy to take any questions directors might have. Okay, thank you. We'll begin with Director Mack, Operations Committee Chairperson. Yeah, as stated, this uh, came for approval and we had robust conversation around it. And um, I don't have any additional questions at this time. Look forward for directors to ask any questions um, or raise any concerns they may have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next up is Director Hampson. Apologies, technical difficulties. Uh, no questions for me at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Director Harris. Uh, questions for, excuse me. Question for Chief Podesta. On the outside chance that we can figure out something to do, whether it's seismic um, issues of Memorial Stadium or improvements, those won't be barred by this contract. There's an escape clause, is there not? Uh, yes. We we can adjust the contract or terminate for convenience if we need to with appropriate notice. And and what is appropriate notice, sir? Um, I'm not uh, sure the term. I think it's 180 days. But I so can. That's a half year, six months. Yeah. And would have six months worth of head start in any event to do any significant work. Is that right? At least uh, the permitting process would probably extend beyond that. Touche. Thanks very much. Thank you, Director Hersey. Uh, no questions from me on this item. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rankin. I do not have questions. We covered this pretty extensively in committee. Thanks. Thank you. Director Vivetta Smith. Yep, no questions for me either. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't have any questions for you at this time. Thank you so much, Chief Podesta. Uh, next is introduction item number 11. This is BEX 5, Distress School Grant Award Contracts K1372, P1797, P1798, and P1796 to Building Envelope Technology and Research Inc. BETNR for technical consultation services during design and on site construction, observation of the building envelope, exterior cladding systems, and roofing systems for the Co Elementary Classroom Edition, Leshy Elementary Classroom Edition, James Madison Middle School class, School Classroom Edition, and Van Asselt Classroom and Gymnasium Edition projects. This came to the Operations Committee on November 5th for approval. So, Chief Podesta, I'll turn it back to you before questions from directors. Yes, our. Um, Thank you again. Our um, capital group um, has uh, begun a new practice to hire an independent expert on uh, building envelopes, which are you know all the exterior portions of buildings, windows, walls, um, masonry, um, exterior doors. These systems and materials have gotten more complex over the year, um, over the years, and with you know, the wet environment that we have in the Northwest, failure of these systems are is very costly and create operational problems. So having an expert in this particular field look at our design, materials, and construction methods, uh, independent of um, the contractors building this, you know, are bringing more sophisticated, uh, sophisticated uh, expertise and um, hopefully will lead to longer life in our buildings and better operations and, um, um, you know, more comfortable and safe buildings. Thank you. All right, we'll start with Director Mack, our Operations Committee Chair. Um, I just want to say that I appreciate that these are all, uh, it's incredibly important that we do this work because we've had issues of failure in the past, and so this is a, a fiduciary responsibility effort as well as I appreciate staff's um, thoughtful work to bundle the projects together instead of having six million bars come in front of us individually. Um, and uh, with that, I encourage any director questions or concerns. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next up is Director Hampson. 
Um, I don't have any questions. This seems like a good move and um, I look forward to uh, supporting it. Thank you, Director Harris. Um, question to Desta. Why not put the independent examination and audit, if you will, onto the contractors so we aren't taking the hit, but that's part of their bid structure for future con uh, consideration? I, I think, um, again, with classroom additions and we have multiple contractors and um, you know we've just learned the hard way um, I, I meant the some directors may re remember um, me bringing this rotted piece of iron to a, a board meeting more than a year ago from rising star that um, really related to how the roof was constructed and the interior systems related to that roof that was the work of many contractors and one um, architect. And we can um, certainly, you know, try to, to pass the risk on and deal with this with claims after the fact, but these are the kinds of failures that typically happen years later, not, you know, within the life of the building, but, you know, 10 years later, you realize that this design um, was not good. So we just feel it's, um, this is an opportunity for us to measure twice and cut once. Is this something you could take up with the uh, Sec 5 committee? Absolutely. Okay. Certainly, I, I, I expect we've gotten advice from them, but we, we could certainly talk to them about it. Thank you so much. Director Hersey. We discussed this uh, ad nauseum in uh, uh, committee, so I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Director Rankin. Um, I, no, I don't have questions. Um, as, as Mr. Podesta said, you know, I wasn't on the board at the time, but the piece of roofing from um, uh, now Rising Star, um, and I'm trying to remember when, if this was in committee for this item or something else, but where we were talking about roofing and, you know, the um, the envelope really is a whole nother piece separate from the architecture. And if the if the envelope isn't done correctly, there's so, a ton of potential for trapped. Uh, moisture and other things that can then just completely um, uh, wreak havoc on the whole building and the health of the building, um, even if the, you know, the roof is sound and waterproof, um, just to do with airflow and stuff. So, so I, I do think this is, um, you know, if you look up at the roof of your apartment building or house, look up, look up under the eaves, you'll see little um slits vents and that's to that's to you know prevent this on you know in the home a smaller scale than a school but anyway um it, it seems well worth uh the upfront um investment to make sure that we don't have surprises down the line thank you director rivetta smith thank you i have no questions Thank you, and thank you, Chief Podesta. We'll move on to introduction item number 12. This is Distressed School Grant Award Architectural and Engineering Contract P1717 to Thomas Cook Fitzgerald Architecture, TCF, for the Leshy Elementary School Four Classroom Addition Project. This came to the Operations Committee on November 5th for approval. Chief Podesta, back to you. Yes, as, as was referenced in the last uh, agenda item, we are doing a four classroom addition at the north end of uh, Leshy Elementary. Um, and this action uh, allows us to hire uh, architecture and engineering firm to help us with the uh, design. Um, the, um, this was awarded through a competitive process where we had six respondents um, and interviewed three and have um, uh, selected um, this firm. Um, 
Thomas Cook Fitzgerald uh, to do the design, and this would authorize us to start work. All right, beginning with Director Mack, our Operations Committee Chairperson. Uh, thank you. I uh, just want to note that it was brought up in committee uh, under the context of this um, that we, in this near term, and I don't think it's on the next operations agenda, but we've asked to get a summary of the stress pool grant funding over the last few years um, because these sorts of things that are uh, provided from the legislature um, as one officer. Um, really important and wonderful to be getting, um, but it would be helpful to have a little bit more clarity around all of the, uh, all of that. So um, uh, appreciate this coming forward, support this bar in front of us, and um, thank you to the legislature and the uh, representatives that have supported uh, this effort. Thank you. All right, next is Director Hampson. Uh, no question. Thank you. Thank you, Director Hersey. Excuse me, Director Harris. No question. Thank you, Director Hersey. Now, <laughs> not for me. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rankin. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you, Director Yvetta Smith. No questions. Thank you. And Director Veta Smith, I know you have a hard stop at 7:30, so I'd love to give you just a small opportunity between these two introduction items, if you'd like to share. I think you have an event coming up quickly before we move to the next item. Oh, sure, thank you. Yeah, I do have. I'm so sorry, everybody. I have to run. I have a 7:30 practice for an event I'm having tomorrow night, which you are all invited to. Is a uh, student town hall. <laughs> I'm doing one, and I know it's been pretty. Uh, I am incognito, but it's for District 2 specifically. It's going to be amongst um, District 2 students. I um, got a lot of cooperation from my principals where they have selected school represent student leaders to collect feedback from their other students, their schools regarding remote learning. And they're going to be presenting that tomorrow night via a Teams live event. It's a kind of webinar style where there will be presenters along with me and everyone is open to the public to watch. Um, but uh, viewers will not be seen or heard, so it's ultra safe, um, except there will be a Q&A, which is moderated. So anyhow, I'd love for you all to attend. If you can't attend, don't worry. I will send you a link to a recording so you all can hear what these students, uh, their feedback and suggestions. I'm really excited to hear from them, and I'm really sorry I got to run, but I got a 7.30 practice with them because that's late for them, and yes. uh, I, I, I appreciate the time that you share on this. Uh, for the um, community, sorry, public testimony speakers, I, I do want to still respond to you, and I will do that, I think. Uh, I'll post it to my Facebook page or something because um, I want to get it out of the There's a lot that was said there. So thank you all. Got to run. Have a good evening. Thank, thank you, Director Verson. Okay, next we'll move to introduction item number 13. This is BEX 5, resolution 2020-21-12, racial imbalance analysis for Rainier Beach High School replacement project. This came to the operations committee on November 5th for approval. So Chief Podesta, back to you before questions from directors. Uh, yes, we, um, in order to be eligible for state funding for our capital projects, um, the district is required, um, the board is required to pass a resolution um, to attest that a given project would not create a situation where enrollment at a given school would become racially imbalanced, or if it's already imbalanced, whether the project would make it more so. Um, this is based on analysis done per very specific parameters identified um, by state statute and um, We've done that analysis. It's attached um, to the board action report um, for Rain near Beach High School, which would be a school replacement, as you're aware, and um, have determined that uh, this uh, project will not create or aggravate a racial imbalance at the school. Okay, thank you. We'll begin with Director Mack, our Operations Committee Chairperson. Uh, this is, I don't know, the fourth that we've had in front of us recently. Um, the analysis is all there, and um, I don't have any additional questions. Robust conversation in 
off um, and uh, appreciate any additional questions at this time. Thank you. Beginning with Director Hampson. Uh, no, no questions for me. Thank you. Thank you, Director Harris. Uh, no questions, but a thank you for putting the actual numbers as an attachment. That doesn't always happen, and it's much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Director Hersey. No questions for me. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rankin. Uh, no questions, thanks. Okay, thank you so much. All right, and I don't have any questions for you at this time. Thank you for the information, Fred. Uh, next item is introduction item number 14. This is VEX 5 Award Architectural and an Engineering Contract P111, excuse me, P1776 to Mal Malhum Architects for the Lincoln High School Phase 2 project. This came to the Operations Committee on November 5th for approval. Uh, Chief Podesta, over to you before we do questions. Yes, thank you. Um, as you know, uh, the district reopened Lincoln High School in the fall of 2019, um, and that renovation um, focused on buildings on the west side of the campus. There's always been planned a phase two um, project to focus on east side buildings and includes improvements overall for seismic safety in those buildings, improvements to the theater, um, the gymnasium, and um, career and technical education programs. Um, uh, the architect and engineering contract being proposed was selected through, a, again, a competitive process and again um, uh, we had a uh, robust set of respondents six firms um, proposed work and um, Malum Architects was uh, recommended by our selection committee and authorizing this will begin um, the design phase of this project thank you thank you okay we'll begin with director Mac operations committee chair yes thank you just to give a little context because we're going to see this you know as with all projects, we see a whole bunch of bars come in front of us. Uh, but to give context for this one and this project in, in particular, going back in history, um, there were cuts previously made to the overall Lincoln project, which wouldn't have um, enabled these buildings to be seismically retrofit. And um, uh, I, I'm personally incredibly grateful because what's being retrofit and what's being supported here is uh, the performing arts uh, section as well as another uh, number of other buildings that are really in incredibly important, not just to Lincoln High School, but are utilized by the other schools uh, in the surrounding area. Um, and um, so just very excited to see this move forward and grateful to uh, the um, the voters for supporting our levies and, and um, look forward to any additional questions or comments from directors. Thank you. Thank you. Director Hampson. No questions. Thank you. Thank you. Director Harris. No questions. Thank you. Director None for me. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rankin. I'm excited about the potential for access to more students to performing arts space, but other than that, nothing for me. Thank you. And I have any questions for you at this time, Fred. Thank you for bringing this forward. Introduction item number 15. This is VEX 5 resolution 2020 slash 21 dash 15 approval of general contractor slash construction manager GCCM delivery method and award general contractor construction manager GCCM contract P5153 to lighting construction Inc for the Lincoln High School phase two project. This came to the operations committee on November 5th for approval. Chief Podesta over to you. Uh, thank you. As uh, Director Mack foreshadowed, um, the Lincoln Phase Two projects will bring um, several board actions before the board, and here's one right now. Um, the state law uh, requires public agencies on public works projects to typically um, do a design bid build project, design projects, and then do a bid and pick the lowest cost vendor. 
It also allows for a alternative public works process, several of them, but one is the general contractor construction manager um, delivery method, which is what this is, which allows us to procure services through an RFP instead of just a low bid and then hire a general contractor who will help um, manage the project and bid out the rest of the work, which gets, uh, um, but um, given that that's an alternative process, it needs um, to be uh, approved by uh, a, a state review commission, which this has been, and then the board is required to pass a resolution accepting us using this alternative um, public works method. Um, and then uh, we again have done a competitive process through a request for proposals and have select uh, uh, got a robust response to that. And um, Leidig was selected as the successful um, respondent. Um, Leidig did do the phase one of the Lincoln um, modernization project, so understands the site and understands the district's capital program well. Um, and this will allow us to, uh, again, get our contractors, our general contractor on board earlier and have him be more of a partner in the project than the typical uh, design bid build process. So we're um, excited to um, have a contractor on board who's been successful and understands our site well. And between the um, architecture and engineering contract we just discussed in this, this will um, get us prepared to uh, begin this project and, and complete all the work at Lincoln High School. Thank you. We'll begin with Director Mack, Operations Committee Chair. Yes, thank you. Um, and thank you, Fred, for kind of uh, underscoring the fact that there's multiple bars that come in front of us for various projects. And this is the second one on the Lincoln Phase 2 project that's in front of us. Um, and I appreciate the questions that have come forward and the fact that folks don't have a ton of questions because we do a lot of good work and moving through in Operations Committee to have it fully prepared by the time it comes to us. And so I just want to um, uh, reflect back to the executive committee for the next agenda planning that uh, of this bar and the other bars that have all been, uh, you know, widely non needing to be discussed, uh, happy for them to be moved forward to the consent agenda for the next board meeting um, in interest of time. Just wanted to throw that out, President DeWolf. And I have no questions about this. Look forward to any questions coming forward. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Director Hampson. Uh, no questions. I'm sure uh, Director Vera Smith would be very happy about this if she were on here. She's not, so I'll be happy mm -hmm. for her. Thanks. Next is, thank you, Director Harris. Channeling her, I love it. Uh, quick question for Chief Podesta. Is Lighted Construction the folks that did the initial work on, on reopening Lincoln? Yes. Well, if they do half as good a job as they've done so far, go team. Thank you. Thank you. Director Hersey. None for me. Thank you. Thank you. Director Rankin. No question. Thank you. Thank you. And none for me, uh, Chief Podesta. We'll move on to items. Uh, 16 and 17, if we could present those uh, at the same time. And these are for introduction items number 16, which is BTA 4, final acceptance of contract K5102 with King County Directors Association, KCDA, and Musco Sports Lighting LLC for the athletic field lighting at Robert Eagle Staff Middle School project. This came to the Operations Committee on November 5th for approval, as well as introduction item number 17, BEX 4 and BTA 4, final acceptance of contract K5108 with Western Ventures Construction for the, J, the John Stanford Center for Educational Excellence Freezer Upgrade Project, which came to the Operations Committee on November 5th for approval as well. Chief Fidesta, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, yes, these, uh, both these projects were um, completed in August substantially completed in August of 2019. Um, one was a field lighting system um, for the Robert Eagle Staff uh, Middle School. And the second was um, upgrades to the freezer in the John Stanford Center, the central kitchen. Um, adjacent to it is a very large, uh, over 7,000 foot square foot walk-in freezer that um, stores um, the food, the frozen goods that we use for our nutrition services program. 
um, the walls and um, were repaired for the freezer and the uh, equipment was replaced. And again, at Robert Eagle staff, we installed lights. Um, um, these were done last year. We're ready to accept all the work. They were both um, completed successfully. And, and the freezer in particular in the intervening year, um, given how much food we're preparing out of the central kitchen as we have changed our meal delivery program has been very heavily used and um, is always very full. So we very appreciate um, that this work was completed and the system is working better. Okay, any final comments or questions on these final acceptances, starting with Director Mack? Uh, nope, yay, final acceptance. Other questions yay. or comments, welcome. Yes. Thank you. Director Director Hampson. I could not be more grateful for that freezer. Thank you so much. No further questions. <laughs> Thank you. Director Harris. Outstanding. Thanks. Thank you. Director Hersey. Excited. Thank you. Thank you. Director Rankin. No, I'm one of the things I'm maddest about about the closure in March is that I didn't get to do my my tour of all of the central facilities, including the giant freezer. I'm still mad, but I'm happy about this. <laughs> Thank you, Director Rankin. And other than that, direct, uh, Chief Podesta, just congratulations again on these final acceptances. Thank you. Okay, Director, that, that moves us through our introduction items. I did want to call attention to the fact that um, I wanted to, before we move to the board comment section of the agenda and we adjourn, uh, and before we move into individual director comments, I will note that the board's 2020 self-evaluation has been posted to the agenda for this meeting. With special thank you to Director Rivera Smith for her work in helping to develop that that document. And uh, thank you also, especially to Ms. Wilson Jones, who is our uh, lone person still in the board office as we are going through some staffing changes. So great thanks to her as well for managing uh, our high <laughs> intensity work over the last couple of weeks. Um, I wanted to take a little bit of a personal privilege here to just say that this is my last uh, board meeting, uh, full board meeting as your just as serving as your president uh, and chair of the executive committee. Um, and so it has been a really great honor. So I will um, move through directors in alphabetical order. I'll finish us off uh, with board comments and then adjourn. And so we'll start first with director Hampson. Uh, I did not know that this was going to be your, I did not think about that. And um, I uh, just want to say that I am grateful to you for your leadership and um, holding the reins this, this past year. And um, it's been a pleasure having you as a learning, uh, getting to know you as a colleague, I should say, because I did know you before. <laughs> And um, I've, I've learned a lot. Um, I, I, I believe that every time you enter into a relationship with, with someone, um, you ultimately, it's an opportunity to learn about yourself. And I can definitely say that about um, working with you on an executive committee and with you as, as president. So um, thank you for your, for your service. Um, I find it very, I struggle every time to, when we get to the end of these meetings, to say something meaningful. Everyone's worked so hard, staff, um, I just feel like I want to shut up and send you all home. And um, I, even though you're already home, but you need to be with your families and I need to be with my family. Um, and I think especially right now, um, holding our loved ones close, appreciating the time that we have with them, um, with all of the, the stress that we have. And um, I, I actually, I think I just want to take this moment and say, you know, we're, we're on the right path as a district. We've watched other districts open and close and, um, you know, kind of go back and forth and we've held pretty steady. And I'm really grateful for that. I'm really um, proud of us for doing that. We have sub substantive areas of improvement um, in, in everything that we're doing. But, um, you know, if nothing else, we've, we've held the line in terms of staying closed and then trying to find other ways to serve um, students who need it the most. Um, and there were some inspiring stories that came up this week around that. Uh, I am uh, uh, have been focused on helping my students in my house this week. And um, I'm looking forward to spending more time with um, my family next week and everyone um, having a break. 
Um, and so with that, I'll just say that I am incredibly grateful. I know I can see the exhaustion on people's faces. Um, others can probably see it on mine, but I, I do see it. And I'm looking forward to everyone having a break and um, to hopefully, you know, that the, that we're, we're about to finish off um, one of the most difficult years in history. And, um, and I'm looking forward to that happening and to moving into a new year um, that is substantially more promising. And um, so grateful to all of you tonight. And I will um, leave it at that, Pina Gigi. Um, and uh, my heart goes out to everyone that is dealing with COVID related illness and um, death and stress. And um, we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Director Harris. Uh, the, the stress issue that Director Hansen brought up is so collective and so embedded, not just in this school district and our families and our staff, but all over this city and this country. And uh, yay for the young people getting out and voting. Yay for the fact that people of color were the ones that turned this election around. Let's hope that we keep everybody uh, embedded and active in, in where this country goes. And I couldn't be more pleased to say sayonara, goodbye, ciao to Director Betsy DeVos, uh, Secretary <laughs> DeVos. I, I hope fervently that we get a real educator in that seat, one that understands funding, one that understands democracy, and one that understands opening the doors of our schools and making them superb is, is, is everything for our young people. Um, what an extraordinarily long month. Um, on the issues of stress and the emails and the community feedback we get, I, I will say it again. Uh, when you send your emails, please give us constructive comments. Please give us your best ideas. Please give us some context. Uh, which school, which part of the, the city you live in so that we can sift and measure those comments better. Um, and, and also, I want to say to all the folks that, frankly, are bordering on harassment to at least this board director about whether or not this board of directors will be extending the superintendent's contract, um, I, I need you to be more thoughtful. These are very difficult decisions. Every one of my colleagues and myself are taking them very seriously. And uh, there's a whole lot we can't talk about because that's executive privilege. And to talk about it would be to be breaking the law and that's not okay. Um, but, but I would really encourage people to back the hell off. I think every one of us understand what our fiduciary duties are. And I will go on the record at this time as saying, I don't believe the middle of a pandemic is the time to change superintendent. Now, am I thrilled with everything that Superintendent Denise Juneau has done or not done? Absolutely not. But I can say with, with alacrity that I have had good conversation. I have had face-to-face -face conversation with my disappointment. Uh, I do hope to get a community meeting online going in December, and I can't tell you how much I miss personal contact, both with my colleagues, with the staff, and with our community. I, I find it extremely one-dimensional doing business this way and, and very frustrating because we lose tenor and tone, and, and I think we lose a lot of what makes us really strong, and that's our teamwork, our we, our. Um, not our me and mine, but I think some extraordinarily hard work has been done this last year. Some extraordinarily difficult um, conversations are being had and continue to be had. 
and we're having, I believe, a work session tomorrow on uh, 0040. And that anti-racist policy, I think, is going to be a thing of beauty when people talk to each other and collaborate. And I'm very excited about it. I'm also extremely excited that since 2012, the passing of 0030, we may finally have some superintendent procedures. And superintendent procedures matter because they are a basis to hold people accountable. And, and that matters to every one of us as well. We are absolutely paying attention. And I thank you and have really happy and safe holidays and small holidays so you don't have an ICU Christmas. Thank you. Thank you, Director Percy. I'll keep my comments brief. I just want to give a huge shout out to Director Aaron Smith and um, Director Kerry Campbell, or Chief Kerry Campbell, sorry, um, this has been a long day, um, for coming through the District 7 equity meetings that we've been hosting weekly with uh, PTSA and other community leaders. Um, the feedback from those sessions has been nothing but gracious and, and very appreciative for your presence and, and continued collaboration. So if either one of you are listening on the call, just know that I appreciate you and look forward to continuing to work with you through through that opportunity. Um, if there are any, I, I might be coming to other senior staff members uh, as the group asks questions about how uh, District 7 can continue to engage and, and help drive policy uh, for our district in a significant way. So again, just thank you to um, those two staff members who have come through. I, we really appreciate your time and presence and I'll, I'll wrap it up there. Thank you, Director Mack. <clears throat> yeah, it's 7.51, we've been on since 3.30. And my brain is um, about dead. <laughs> Uh, but I um, I want to say, and I know they're no longer on the call, but I appreciate all of the community members that come to continue to speak to us about the issues that uh, are in front of us and raise their voices and um, appreciate that we continue to do our best to um, incorporate all of the voices that are coming to us and consider those in the policy making that we're doing. Um, I. I also want to extend my gratitude to my fellow colleagues today for the conversations around the niggly little policy and procedure um, aspects that have real impacts on student safety and harassment, intimidation, and bullying, and that those sorts of um, those sorts of policy and procedure that end up kind of maybe not directly in front of us, that but the operationalizing of the work is incredibly important, and I just appreciate you all continuing to have the conversation about how we can work together to improve those systems and continue moving this work forward. Um, I do want to say that um, this pandemic continues to be incredibly difficult, and um, it's hard on all of us appreciate the comments from my colleagues about how this kind of continued stress of isolation. And then again, now we have, we have next week of holiday break that is typically a time for gathering with friends and families and we can't, um, and it's heartbreaking. Um, additionally, other districts around us have been successful in terms of bringing uh, our highest need students, our special ed students back into the classroom and providing services that are needed to them. And I'm struggling with where we're at on that front, uh, knowing that there are a lot of families and students that are struggling without having needed supports. Um, and I'm hopeful we can continue to find a way forward in order to support students and keep us all safe uh, in the middle of this pandemic um, because both are, both are, it's a both and situation. It shouldn't be an either or. 
And um, I think that's all. I appreciate all of you and the work that you're doing and um, look forward to the next um, next time we meet and continue to work together. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rankin. Thank you, and um, thank you, Zachary, for, for leading us um, <laughs> in this terrible, terrible timeline that we're all <laughs> living in. Um, I think uh, Director Hampson was saying to me the other day, you know, this is, we're almost into our, we're almost close, we're closing in on our first year on the board, and it, it feels like it's already been a full four-year term in one, and there's still three more years ahead of us. <laughs> But um, it was it was really nice having having some experience guiding us at the helm this year. So thank you, Zachary. Um, I uh, wanted to just give a giant, giant, huge shout out to teachers. Um, and uh, support something uh, or, or voice my support for something that uh, Superintendent Juno mentioned in her comments at the beginning of the meeting, which was looking at easing up some requirements or um, changing what the day looks like on Wednesdays for elementary school. And I am, was really happy to hear that because that's actually something I had meant to put into an email to say, hey, are we thinking at all about this? Um, because what I, I have... I'm the parent of a middle schooler and an elementary school student. And um, that Wednesday time, the way that um, my son's middle school is using that Wednesday time is really smart and gives them, you know, gives, gives the teacher some opportunity to kind of, you know, catch up on, you know, maybe late assignments that have been turned in to track those down to, uh, you know, do grading and, and other stuff and also meet in small groups um, with students that might need a little more support and be available for office hours. And, um, and I see my elementary students teacher, um, trying to offer that same support to her students, but she has to do it at the end of, of a day of teaching. And I know Wednesday, it's not a full day, but, uh, I think that students and teachers could use that, um, pause in the middle of the week, um, especially, you know, for littler kids to just have some more, a little bit more freedom and for the, for the teachers to have the time given to them to, uh, reach out to families, to support families directly. Um, so just, uh, however that comes forward, I, I think that's great. I was really glad to hear that in the comments because I think it will be, um, helpful. Um, uh, <laughs> my sixth grader, was called, you know, asked to join a small group today because he was missing several assignments. And I'm not going to name the teacher or the class, just a, a huge shout out <laughs> to this person um, who was using that time so well to bring in uh, the students that needed more support. And the, the common thing between all of them when they were talking about, you know, well, let me help you, what, what's, what are you missing these assignments for? Most of them knew, you know, they, they said they, they thought that the amount of amount of work was appropriate um, and they mostly knew where to find the assignments and they just were finding it hard to be motivated to do it. And I think that we're all feeling that, that right now. Um, uh, and, and so, yeah, any time that we can give for that extra connection, I think is great. Um, the, the one thing I want to say more broadly is we are now, you know, finding ourselves in a second phase of more um, restrictions and guidance from the state. And I will be uh, emailing my, my fellow board directors, but I just want to mention here now that my sort of broader ask is that uh, as hopefully cases go you know, transmission declines again, we hope, um, that really one of the biggest, one of the biggest things we were hearing from constituents and one of the biggest um, in, uh, thing affecting, you know, whether or not or how we can return to buildings is actually community spread. We need community spread to go down. So what I'll be emailing you all and hope that we can um, support each other in making some kind of a statement or request to the 
to the state that to the governor that um, not to say that that students need to go back as soon as possible, but but to ask that when the time comes to, you know, quote unquote, reopen since we're supposedly locking down more um, that students and schools are considered a priority as opposed to um, you know, returning everyone to to kind of social gathering things and and having um, students and schools be last. So I'll be emailing you all about that because I just the impact on on everybody when when all of our kids are isolated from each other and and um, and and on families, working families is huge, and we need to be um, those needs need to come closer to the top. Um, and uh, so just yeah, just big hugs and distance hugs to everybody uh, is tough. And um, uh, thank you all. Thank you, Director Rankin. Uh, I will save my comments for our December 2nd meeting. I thank you all for your participation tonight. Thank you to the staff for joining us. Thank you to Superintendent Juno for being here. And thank you to the folks that spoke during public comment. There being no further business on this tonight's agenda. I will now adjourn this meeting at 8.01 p.m. Wednesday, November 18th. I look forward to seeing you all on December 2nd, and please have a safe, um, enjoyable, and healthy time over the course of the next two weeks. Thanks, all. Good night. Thank you.